afternoon, everybody, and welcome on the Sunset Safari here in magnificent South Africa, northeastern corners thereof. We're in the Kruger National Park. My name is James Hendry. On camera today, Brian Joubert, the thumb. He's got some fairly intimidating looking dark glasses on and a very spanky new blue hat. Lovely. Uh, you are on a live safari. I didn't know there was a buffalo there, but there is a buffalo there. And because we're on a live safari, well, we just don't know what we're going to see, first of all. And second of all, we'd love you to talk to us, please. Questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. Or hash... or... Hmm? My head's in the way. Or hashtag safari live if you're on the tweet tweet. Now, if you are a first-time viewer, this is a live safari. And we are in, like I say, South Africa the southernmost country in Africa, recently voted, and I kid you not here, the most beautiful country in the world. Probably largely by South Africans, but I don't think they got it wrong. Our plan this afternoon is to head towards some lions, see what they are doing. They were found this morning, and I suspect they'll be fast asleep at this stage of the day. It's a sort of balmy 28 degrees Celsius, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see the sun peeping through the gray clouds here. Gray clouds which in many parts of the world are considered something of a bad omen and unpleasant here. A merciful relief from the blinding heat of what is a drought-ridden summer. On the other vehicle, Scott Dyson being filmed by David. Unfortunately, they have got no signal at the moment, so you're going to be stuck with me waffling at you for the foreseeable future. In the final control, we have Nicola on the vocals and Leanne on the keys. And that is all I have to tell you about the team. We're going to leave this fellow here. He doesn't seem to be doing great deal and we're going to see if we can find the lions i don't think they're going to be doing a great deal at this time of the day either but yesterday round about this time it was quite rainy and blustery and they killed a young zebra at about half past five in the afternoon so that was about an hour and a half from now and i'm sure they're going to go hunting sometime either tonight maybe this afternoon but you can see it is brightening up a bit i think this cloud bank that has been over us for the last two or four days is about to start dissipating now. It certainly feels very muggy and humid, very kind of um, close. The air feels close, does it not, Brian? Mm. Now, the lions were found just up ahead here. We'll see if they're still there. They may have moved off into some shade. So let's go and see if they're there. Scrutti. Scott is up and running, but let's see if we can find these lions first. Hello, Yvonne. You're in Stockholm, where you say it is sunny. I, well, I take your word for it, Yvonne. Um, I don't believe that it's particularly warm, though, probably. You say it's quite spring-like. It's quite early for it to be spring-like, I suppose. But Yvonne, Sweden, definitely somewhere I want to go in your summer. Not in the winter, everyone. No, chilly. So not much light, as far as I understand it. Now, the lions were found somewhere along here during the course of the morning. There's a stick hitting the ancient jigger. That is the vehicle that I'm on now. If you do see a tawny shape, be sure to let me know. Five lions of the Ngohuma pride somewhere through here. Let's see if they're here, and if they are not, then we will head across to Scott and see what happens with him. Right, we're getting very close to where they were this morning. Brian, you were here, hey? Mm. Is it a little bit further along? Ah, I see them. There they are. Hello, lions. <laughs> there they are, everyone. The Inkahuma pride, five lionesses, two of them possibly pregnant. They've been mating with the Birmingham boys, some of the others. There was one this morning that I was watching. Um, we did a little highlights package in the final control afterwards, and I saw that she was urinating and kind of rubbing her feet in it, which is totally normal. But I wonder if she hasn't also come into estrus and is perhaps going to seek out the Birmingham boys. With any luck, we will have some lion cubs fairly soon. They are, in my opinion, the cutest animals you could possibly find out here. Right, let's head across to Scott Dyson, find out what his plans for the afternoon are. 
We're going to sit here for a little while, then I think we'll probably move on, see what else we can find before joining the lions a bit later for perhaps a hunt. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome on board with myself, Scott, and David on camera. We are busy discussing the certain parts of Juma that David hasn't maybe necessarily seen yet. We're thinking about maybe going across to Arethusa, but I was there on the sunset safari and there didn't appear to be a great deal going on. So I'm thinking of taking Dave on his first Muwati riverbed cruise, which a lot of you love doing, so you'll be happy to know about that. And for any new viewers, it's something worth sticking around for. It's the main dry riverbed that flows through our property, and it's always good fun driving down a dry riverbed, picturesque scenery, and just good fun in general. But before we get there, I've spotted a bird of prey in the kind of top left-hand side of this tree at 11 o'clock there, Dave. There we go. And to me, that looks like a step buzzard. Hard to believe it would have come all the way out. Ooh, it looks like it may have seen an insect. You saw the way it kind of just jiggled its head from side to side there, indicating that it may be trying to focus on some prey, which for a small raptor like this will usually be insects as well as small rodents. And fascinating that this animal has traveled all the way from the steppe mountains in Russia in order to get you for what is ordinarily a summer bounty. This year, I fear that the long trip was not necessarily entirely worthwhile because of the drought. It's having a massive impact on the amounts of insects and prey for these birds. But thankfully, being able to fly, they can fly to more abundant areas if need be. Unlike an animal like a tortoise or a chameleon that lacks the ability to move huge distances effortlessly or relatively effortlessly. Looks like it may have spotted something again there. Wouldn't it be fun to see it making a kill? Okay. Well, I was hoping it was going to plummet down from its vantage point there, but no joy. Gerard, who's a South African living in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, is busy watching us and just wishing us an action-packed afternoon. And if I remember correctly, Gerard, aren't you due a visit here very soon? I'm sure I remember you saying that sooner rather than later, you're going to be coming out here to visit us. I've just spotted some more raptors circling up to our left. I'm just going to try and get my binoculars onto them as Dave tries to find them in the viewfinder. They're not an easy business. Um, there's, Dave, there's one here at kind of 10 o'clock. There we go. Ooh. Now, if nothing else, if we can't identify this bird, which we should be able to, it's just such an awesome thing watching them float above us. And imagine the views that they are having as they peer down upon us. Judging by its size and its coloration, it could be another migrant, the lesser spotted eagle. It seems to have quite a blotchy coloration, indicative of the lesser spotted eagle. It's also got quite a fan-shaped tail that you may have seen there. It just flew too high up off the arc of the tripod, so that was as much as Dave could do. Um, we'll leave them to it, possibly a lesser spotted eagle, but what that tells us those birds soaring above us, is that even though it's overcast, you can see the sunlight's coming through a little bit now, bursting through the clouds, but even though it's overcast, it's still, the earth is still hot enough to be sending up hot thermals rising up from the earth, allowing these birds of prey to look for food without having to expend any energy. Gerard, good to have you with us, and let us know exactly when you are coming, or at least remind us, please. Very happy that the Inkahuma ladies are still in the same place and don't have a buffalo in between their paws, otherwise that means we would have missed out on the action. And I'm hoping that it won't take the ladies too long to get active this evening. 
But for now, you are going to be going across to join them. Enjoy. High action here at the lion sighting, everybody. One of them, the one in picture, just stood up and urinated on her sister. It was a fascinating thing to see, and now she's lying down in the puddle that she's just made. Her sister, who's clearly taken offense, has moved to another part. I'm not making that up. That is really, genuinely what has just happened here. Quite astonishing. Lions considered the royalty, of course, of the bush felt. I'm not convinced that they aren't sort of nouveau peasantry, to be honest. Anyway, while we look at these slightly disgusting lions, sorry, we're going to head across to back to Scott. He's got an interesting bird to show you. Well, we are just in incredible luck with the raptors today. Some of you may recognize this one from just a couple of days back. I'm fairly certain we saw this at the Juma waterhole. And it looks to me like a little gabar goshawk. It's got a bright little red sear on its beak. Sadly, we cannot see its legs. That would be another confirming characteristic. It should also have red legs. And interestingly enough, you get a melanistic form of this bird. So you get a pitch black form of this. Oh. And it's jiggling and bobbling its head the same way that that step buzzard was earlier. Possibly seeing little insects bobbing about. It's a small bird of prey, only about 30 centimeters from the tip of its tail to the top of its head, and a whopping 164 grams, according to my book. So, I mean, very, very small. Hence, the fact that it feeds on, interestingly, mainly birds, small ones, but also rodents, bats, reptiles, and insects. So I've never seen this bird with any prey, but I'm guessing the smaller kind of birds, but it does say it has taken on prey up to Franklin, which would actually be bigger than itself. Great, well, we take any opportunity we can, not only to show you the big stars of Africa, like the lion, but also the other predators and interesting animals that we get to see so that may be a, another one for a lot of your bird lists if you are joining for the first time it's strongly worth considering starting a bird list because it's a great way to keep track of birds and get enthused by them but for now you guys are going back to the sleeping lions right we haven't moved everyone we well we have we've moved a few inches closer lovely to see all those raptors and of course these lions are going nowhere so if scott does find interesting birds and things like that we should definitely head straight across to him and have a look at those now before you left me last i was about to say that marco from portugal uh, you say that this is your i think you're a new viewer which is wonderful thank you for a watching and b getting hold of us you say you want to know which part of Kruger this is and you, that you hope to visit sometime soon. Well, we're in part of the Greater Kruger National Park. The Sabi Sands Game Reserve is more accurately where we are. Now, that is a section on the western fringes of the Greater Kruger National Park. And it is, it's a collection of private farms, and we're on one called Juma, and we also traverse to the west of us an area called Arethusa. So about 1,500 hectares, 4,500 acres, if you like, of prime wilderness wonderland here in the Greater Kruger National Park. So Marco from Portugal, thank you for getting hold of us. And yeah, come and see us sometime. Or just visit any part of the Kruger. So as Scott says, I mean, these lions have not, have obviously haven't moved. They haven't killed anything today. They look pretty well fed. I don't think they're badly fed at all, but I think they could probably eat again, given the fact that they only ate a very small zebra yesterday. Now, Debbie, you want to know why I just cast aspersions on the lion's character by calling them fairly disgusting and peasants. Debbie, the lioness uh, not that one particularly. In fact, it was that, that very one you're looking at. She stood up, and then she was lying right next to her sister, 
who has since moved, and I don't blame her, she stood up and she then urinated on her sister. Uh, I found that a fairly distasteful thing to do, and that is why I said, although renowned for being the royalty of the wilderness, lions do behave a little bit like the, a peasantry at some stages. And the sister eventually got up and moved, and this lioness went back and lay down in the puddle that she had made. Now, it, that's not actually, I'm being a little bit facetious. It can be a, a form of heat regulation. I know hyenas definitely do that. A lot of birds do that too. It's not very hot today. Lions just generally couldn't be bothered to move. And the site around which they've lain, especially if they've got a kill, is normally a fairly distastefully smelling latrine area by the time they eventually move on. It's totally normal. It's totally natural, of course. As we, as we watch the tail there of that lioness, you can see how close we are to them, probably only about 10 meters, 30 feet. They're fast asleep, and that panting stomach has got something to do with the fact that it's hot, and also to do with the fact that that stomach still is containing a little bit of zebra in it. And Connie, you were watching last night, and we got very close to these lows lions last night too. One of them came and sat within sort of three feet of us, and David, of course, who's our new cameraman, he has not done wildlife before, and uh, I looked behind me, and even though it was dark, his face was glowing ashen in the, in the moonlight or in the cloudy dim, dimness of the evening. And I said, David, are you all right? And he, he said, yes, he was okay, but, um, you know, he'd never been that close to a lion before. And, of course, it must be completely terrifying. If you've never experienced this before, you'd expect a lion to see us as something to eat, jump on the back of the vehicle, and perhaps eat one of us. Well, thankfully that doesn't happen, mainly because the staff turnover would make things very awkward for management. And um, the reason it doesn't happen is because lions just simply do not see us as something to eat on the back of the vehicle and on foot. They also don't see us as something to eat. They see us as a threat. In the vehicle, we kind of have a, a neutral neutrality around them and they just get on with life and they don't worry about us at all. Which is why it was perfectly safe for David to be sitting within three feet of the lioness last night. So, interesting, Jackie, you're in PE. I'm not sure if we've heard from you before, but if we have, um, well, welcome back. And if we haven't, thank you very much for getting hold of us. Now, just as a bit of background to Jackie's question, last night, after that zebra was taken down, it was a young zebra, probably two or three years old, and not years, two or three months old. And what these lionesses did, some of them really got into the underbelly very quickly, but three or four, three or four of them were just licking at the fur. And Jackie, you want to know why were they grooming that zebra before consuming it? It wasn't grooming, Jackie. It's a, they're one of two reasons. The first one is that it clears the skin, or the, the hair away, which allows them to then get at the skin, open it up and eat out, obviously, the contents. I was watching that again today. And I think there's a second reason. I think that hair helps a lot with digestion and I think before they consume a lot of meat I think they're licking there and swallowing some of that hair to help get through the digestive system remember there's absolutely no roughage in any of the food that they eat often lions you'll see if there is grass they will eat grass and that's to line the stomach and help with digestion I think I haven't read this and this is purely my own kind of guess that they are licking that hair in order to eat it as roughage. It'll come out in the dung, obviously almost completely undigested, but I think it helps with the digestion of a plain protein meat diet. I think that's a large reason that they do that licking before they start eating the meat. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it though. So like I said, I don't think we're gonna spend a great deal of time here um, unless there is some enormously important questions people would like to ask, and that's okay, I'm very happy to sit here. But I don't think these lionesses are going to do a great deal. The, first, the only thing I do want to point out is their ages, or certainly how you can tell their ages. And the one sitting on the right-hand side of your picture now, of course, has an extremely pink nose. Now, 
The nose goes totally black by the time they are six years old. You can see she's got one or two little black spots in her nose. Those are not flies, those are spots. And she, if I'm not mistaken, is about three. And then the other one looking up towards us on, in the middle. That's it, Brian. She's also got a relatively pink nose, and there was some discussion a little while back over as to who and how old they all are. But the nose, to me, is the best way of telling. And this one is now being completely uncooperative. There we go. You can see she's got quite, oh, she's got more black on her nose, so she's probably, she's probably almost a year older. And she'll be looking up at the sky, seeing if she can find a vulture or two, because lions, of course, are excellent scavengers. So if she can find a vulture or two, they might follow a vulture and then steal whatever it is that they've seen on the ground. Now you can see that nose is much blacker. Panting, of course, because it is relatively hot and I think also the humidity is quite tough for these dear old lions to deal with. Ah, marvellous Deb, you're in Ohio and you've brought a friend with you on safari today. It's lovely that you've done that for us. Thank you very much. And her name is Kathy Lewis and she's from West Virginia, which I, as far as I'm, my US geography goes is quite a long way from Ohio. So welcome Kathy Lewis from West Virginia. I hope that you will go back to West Virginia when you have finished your holiday in Ohio and um, watch us from there. Ooh, that's quite interesting. There's a bit of a gash on her neck there. You see that, Brian? Now, Tour Pro, as we look at a fairly nasty gash, that looks like a puncture mark. It looks like a, a tooth mark to me on that lioness, that young lioness. Tour Pro, you say you're very glad you don't have to eat hair in order to line your gut. I'm equally glad that I don't have to tour pro. Uh, we of course do have to eat certain amounts of roughage in the form of vegetables. And Pamela, you want to know if they get hairballs from the amount of hair that they consume. I have seen lions with hairballs. I've seen leopard definitely with hairballs. So yes, I'm sure they do get hairballs. I wonder what bit her there. Something has bitten her. I think it was probably... Oh, it's a claw mark from one of the lions at the kill. It's not unusual after a kill like we had last night, especially a small one, for the lions to have injuries from each other. They are not an egalitarian society, i.e. they do not look after each other, especially at a kill, and they will basically try and steal as much of that kill as they can. They'll try and monopolize every piece of it for themselves. She's dreaming. <laughs> Brian says she's dreaming. She, she keeps twitching her ears. She's thinking about her next meal. Now, Stephen, Stephen with a PH, um, <laughs> I was going to make an extremely poor joke there. I'm going to stop myself. Stephen, you would like to know about I mean, we're sitting here within 30 feet of them, and you want to know, um, well, what would happen if we got out of the car? Shall I show them, Brian? Don't be silly, I won't do that. Uh, Stephen, what they would do is probably get up, they'd probably growl, and then they'd run off into the drainage line here and look offended. It would be highly unlikely that they would take any further steps towards me. They would become extremely aware of my bipedal posture, i.e. stand my sort of humanoid standing on two feet posture. They wouldn't like that at all. They would recognize it as a predator and they would run away. If they felt cornered, then certainly they would charge and they would probably charge to within, well, I mean, at this distance, they'd come within sort of two meters or six feet and there they would wait to see what happened. And then if I got back in the vehicle, it would probably def def diffuse. But I'm not going to try it, Stephen. That would just be silly. And I 
know you can watch the odd documentary where people will um, walk about with lions and walk into them and show how brave and strong they are. But lions see us as predators. And so when they do turn around and charge, they're not being aggressive, they're feeling threatened. They're feeling like you have invaded their space, which of course, if you walk into them on foot, you have. And they're therefore saying to you, go away, which I think is entirely fair enough. That's an interesting one from Teresa. I'm obviously yakking away here, talking about bits and pieces of lion biology, and none of the lions are moving at all or reacting to the sound of my voice. And you say, you want to know if they perhaps recognize my voice individually. Um, I don't believe they do, you know, Teresa. I think they just hear this kind of waffling. I'm sure that they probably can hear the difference between, say, my voice, which tends to be quite bassy at the bottom end, and uh, Jamie's voice, which, of course, is a little bit more highly pitched, and Brent's voice, which is roughly the same volume as the foghorn in the Cape Town Harbour, and Scott's, which is a bit more subdued than that. They're all very different, of course. I don't think that they notice the difference, to be honest, but um, I think elephants do. I'm pretty sure that elephants... Well, I don't know this for sure, but I think that elephants recognize us individually. And I certainly think they pick up a, a vibe or an energy from us individually, and I'm not convinced that the lions do. I'm not convinced that the lions are the great intellectual giants of the animal world. Ah, now, I know this is quite difficult for you to get perspective when you're watching on your screen. Tammy, you want to know how big a lion's head is in comparison with the human head. Well, let me just give you a, an idea of the size. Um, a, a lion stands about four feet. This, this lion, one of the biggest lions is here, three and a half to four feet at the shoulder, so quite tall, weigh 120 kilograms, so that's about 260 pounds, these lionesses. That's enormous, obviously. Now, my head is roughly that wide. A lion's head would be roughly that wide, and obviously this longer, probably about that long. Yeah. That's what the skull would look like. It's a bit longer with the flesh on it, but that's about the size of the skull. So it is massive. But within that, of course, is a very small brain. Only human beings, well, I mean, and the primates to a certain extent, have got the ratio of head size to body size that we do. So our heads are very large for our mass, and that's to accommodate our large brains. I know some people have got very small brains or certainly use very little of their brains, but compared with the rest of the animal kingdom, you know, we have absolutely enormous brains. And I think a brain of a lion is probably about that big. So when you're learning how to guide on foot, one of the things you have to do is to be able to point out where a brain shot would be. If you had to shoot a charging animal to defend your guests, um, you've got probably yeah, the size of a re somewhere in between a squash ball and a tennis ball you're going to have to hit. So they've got a very tiny brain inside a massive head. And that head, of course, is covered with muscles that help to operate the jaw. And I think, I mean, just as Nikki was saying, she's always surprised. And I, in fact, Louise was saying exactly the same thing to me this morning. She's always surprised when she gets out here how much bigger these animals are in person than they are when you're watching them through a screen. And we forget, of course, sitting where I am and where Brian is, that the perspective you have is the same. So, I mean, when you're looking at an elephant full frame, it looks almost the same size as a lion full frame, I suppose especially if it's not outlined by a tree or something like that. So it is very difficult to get a perspective on their size. But they're pretty big. They're not as big as a bear, for example, or as a brown bear or Kodiak bear. I know a lot of our viewers in the US are not as big as that. They're much bigger than any European predator, though. Well, except I guess you, can, you do get Kodiak bears in Russia. Ah, now, this is a common question, a common query from Leo Pad. You're on, you're on YouTube. 
Leo Pad. Uh, you want to know if there are any man-eating lions. Do man-eating lions occur that specialize in the flesh of the human being? Leo Pad? No, not really. Y there are cases of it, certainly. If a lion does develop a taste for human beings, now that's, that's actually a really bad way of putting it. If a lion kills a human being, they quickly they realize that we're no threat at all, that we are the easiest thing to kill out here, that getting hold of one of us is easier than getting hold of a squirrel, for example. But if that happens, then the lion does be, almost immediately become a man-eater, and they will be destroyed if we can find them. That said, so, I mean, basically in the wild, there, I wouldn't be afraid to walk around in just about any wild area for fear of being eaten by a lion. This is, of course, during the day, not at night when lions lose that sort of fear of people. But there are areas, especially along the southern boundaries of the, of the eastern boundaries of South Africa, and there used to be prides of lions that would patrol the borders there because there were a whole lot of refugees that used to come across from Mozambique and horrible stories of prides of lions that used to specialize in catching these refugees because they're so easy to catch. And of course, a refugee with no idea of how to operate in the bush would come across the, the border, see a lion run. And if you, the worst thing you could do, of course, from a charging lion is run because the lion then sees you as prey and will run after you. So there are incidents of lion hunting and lion man eating of lions, but it's really not a major thing out here. I believe there are quite a few questions on lions, so we'll just stay right where we are, if that's okay with you. But let's go across to Scott in the meantime, just get a quick update and change of scenery, and we'll do one more update when we come back. Hello everyone, and we've literally just stopped the vehicle. We've got into an area where there's some monkeys alarm calling. It sounds like just ahead of us, but we're trying to pinpoint exactly where we've driven a long distance to get you at high speeds. And we wanted to make sure we got you quickly so that we could still hear these monkeys shouting at possibly a leopard. I'm putting my money on a leopard. Moving through the Mawati Riverbed where we were supposed to be taking you on a leisurely cruise, but that's been delayed to come in search of whatever has disrupted these monkeys. Now, they've gone silent now, so there's nothing more to hear. Brent was actually the one who initially heard the alarm calls, and I followed his instructions. I've come around onto Ledwood Road. He's further east of us in the Mulwati, oh, sorry, west of us in the Mulwati River, so we're trying to check kind of two different angles of the same area. Let me just get a hold of Brent again. Brent, did you get any further audio? I, I had one or two more. more after you said you were going to stop. It sounded like possibly south of where you were, were, were stopped. You'll probably find Brent's telling his guests a very interesting story now, and that's why he's not going to respond to us. He also didn't reply to my last message, so I'm not too sure what the problem could be. Possibly a folktale story. He's loving those at the moment. <laughs> it's just creep. No, it's not going to make sense to creep any further into this thick bush unless we have a confirmed sighting of a predator. So we're probably just going to wiggle, wiggle our way back out. So maybe might take a short walk in this area to try and see if I can't find any further sign of this leopard in all likelihood. Like I said, it could be any predator, but I'm guessing a leopard moving at this time of the day through this area. I put my money on a spotted panthera cat. So I'm gonna send you guys back to James. Sadly, you can't join me on this walk as we don't have the backpack with us. Um, and hopefully I'm going to find some sign of this leopard and we're going to track it down and that way be able to get closer to it in the vehicle. Wish us luck and we will see you later. Not much has changed. In fact, nothing has changed. Well, to be fair, I'm not actually being truthful there. I created a bit of a fuss here. I was gargling a bit of salt water to clean my voice away so that I might speak with you in a crystalline fashion. And 
I kind of spat it out onto the ground below us, and the lions shot up as if an electric charge had gone through the ground on which they're lying. Uh, they then went back to sleep, of course, immediately. My heart rate sat at about 180, and Brian had a bit of a giggle to himself, but they seem to have relaxed since then. Very exciting that Scott might have some leopard tracks. I think that's marvellous. Now, one of the things we were watching yesterday is the tearing and rending of flesh from the bones of the zebra we're using the claws that Brian's showing you now and the teeth. Brian, if we can just, oh, no, she's not. Oh, here we go, big action. No, no, she's, no, there we go, she's down. She was showing us her teeth, and James Taylor, you wanted to know if they chew their meat, and I was going to hopefully show you her teeth. I can't do that now. James, they don't have chewing teeth. So most of the chewing that we do with our teeth, of course, is done with the molars and premolars, which are the back teeth. Now, a lion has got molars and premolars, but they are sharpened. They are not flattened like ours. They're sharp, and they are not designed for chewing. So they will slice off pieces of meat and swallow them whole. They will not chew. It's a bit like watching a dog or a cat trying to chew a pellet. They kind of crunch it once or twice and then swallow, but they don't have grinding teeth like we do. They're called carnassials. Ooh, there's a lovely sound there of the black-collared barbet. Isn't that nice? Beautiful. Peaceful afternoon. Hmm. Now, Bethany and Tando, two similar questions. Very nice to hear from both of you. Thank you for your questions. Um, Bethany, you want to know basically what would happen if we, you, I say that they don't see us as a threat because we're sitting down. It's not only that, it's because we're sitting in the vehicle. You say if we sat on the ground here and kind of drove away. So for example, if we got out of the car quietly on that side of the vehicle, sat down on the ground and then rever someone reversed the car out, what would happen? Would the lions not react to us? They'd go ballistic. They'd absolutely react to us. Uh, you'd be forced to stand up very quickly. Um, and that would be your immediate reaction, would be to stand up. That'd be entirely instinctual. It's not that they don't... It's, I don't know that... It's difficult to say. They don't not see us as people here, I don't think, but they don't perceive us as a threat. When you are away from a vehicle like this, remember they're not smelling only human, they're smelling battery acid and petrol and brake fluid and engine oil and aftershave and all that sort of thing. And so it's just a very unfamiliar thing for them and they get used to the shape of the vehicle and our voices and us sitting here. And Tandor, you want to know why they see us as predators? Well, Tandor, our history as a species, as humanity, is two million years old in Africa. We have been, we evolved on this continent and our human ancestors, our ancient bipedal human ancestors evolved here. And as soon as we came out of the trees, as it were, and moved on to the savannas, from that moment on, we've been throwing stones and sticks and basically hunting the animals that were here. We've protected ourselves against lions. We've protected ourselves against all the animals here. And so we have evolved with these animals. And they therefore, in the same way that a kudu sees the lion as a threat, as a predator, so they see us as a threat because we've been a threat to them for millennia. Now the same is very different, for example, with a polar bear. A polar bear did not evolve with people. By the time we as human beings moved into uh, the northern reaches of the, of the world, say it was probably about um, not much more than Call it 50,000, no, call it 40,000 years ago, we were in the northern reaches, probably stretching up into the Arctic. Polar bears by then, of course, we had evolved fully, polar bears had evolved fully, and they saw us as something to eat. And so a polar bear is not afraid of a human being in the slightest. These animals here, though, have evolved with people, and they are afraid of us. I hope that answers your question. It's a good one. <laughs> Now, one 
wonderful, wonderful question here from the best Twitter handle on the entire internet, James Hendry's fan. You're, uh, we've discovered now, is, are in Missouri. Wonderful stuff. <laughs> you want to know if there are any animals out here that a lion would be afraid of, or do they see anything as fair game? They're afraid of elephants quite often. Elephants will not tolerate predators. They don't like predators. They'll chase them around the place. And so they won't, especially in this area, think of elephants as something to eat. That said, if they come across a weakened young elephant, they will certainly have a go at it. But an adult elephant, they wouldn't even think about going at. Same with a rhino, same with a hippo. And an old and distressed or young animal, they might have a go at, but otherwise they would consider them a waste of time. They're just too big to have a go at. Everything else though, James Hendry's fan, uh, they will think of as fair game as something to eat, unless it gets so small that they don't want to worry about it. So a dwarf mongoose, for example, or a squirrel. While if a squirrel ran past a lion, they'd swat it and swallow it in two mouthfuls or even one. Um, they certainly wouldn't actively go and hunt a squirrel. here in New York. Well, this is a lovely question. Ravi, you were watching last night and you say that the emotions, the range of emotions expressed by the viewers was quite astonishing. Now those of you who perhaps missed last night, we watched these lions kill a baby zebra and what they did was they took the zebra down but they didn't kill it. They just started feeding straight away and one of them, Amber Eyes, was around the windpipe, but the rest of them just started feeding. And that zebra took about five minutes to die with its guts ripped open. So it was harrowing. It was harrowing to watch. And Ravi, you've got a brilliant question. You say, why is it that, or do why do I think that we as human beings feel such a tremendous sense of emotion and sadness and trauma and heartache when we watch something like that? And yet when a fly or a mosquito lands on us, we're only too happy to swat it or spray deadly chemicals in the air to kill insects that we don't like. Ravi, I think that it has something to do with the fact that the more closely related to us an animal is, the more a sense of attachment we have to it. I think there's a lot of psychology around the romance of animals and that sort of thing. I mean, certainly if we you were to watch a cow being killed and you'd probably then quite happily eat it but if you were to watch a lion go through the same process you wouldn't think about eating it because you have a different different emotional attachment to the animal and so i think it's got something to do with how closely related to they are to us i think it's got to do with also the fact that especially with our viewers have come to know a lot of the animals that we have here then the other thing about yesterday i think that we would have felt a lot less emotion to be honest if it had been an adult zebra it was a youngster and there's something in our human nature that finds the distress of young animals especially children you know young human animals to be really horrible we can deal with an upset adult but a mewling or sad or miserable child we immediately reach out for emotionally unless we're psychopathic of course and i'm hoping that none of our viewers are psychopathic we, we empathize, and I think that the distress of that zebra was, was palpable because it's relatively closely related to us. Of course, a mosquito, when you slap it on your wrist, doesn't make a horrible distress call. You can't tell whether it's in any kind of stress or not as your hand slaps down on it and its guts splay out over your arm. Yeah, it's just, a, I think it's got a lot more to do with how closely related we are to zebra. And then I think if you were to watch a primate being killed, for example, it would be even worse. So, something to do with that, Ravi. I hope that gives you some kind of an answer. Hmm. And Jody, you're absolutely right. I mean, you see these lionesses look so cute, especially that one we're looking at now with her feet up there. It's hard to believe that they could become these deadly killers and seemingly without sympathy 
And one of the interesting things that we were asked yesterday was how can they possibly start eating when that animal is in such distress? And that is a classic case of anthropomorphism. We think of lions as being cute and sweet and although they, we accept they have to eat, we don't consider them cruel. If a human being started eating an animal before it died, we'd consider it very cruel. There are many people in the world who find the practice of putting a live lobster in boiling water cruel. I think it's horrendously cruel. And yet, when a lion does it, um, we consider it awful. You know, it's, it's dreadfully cruel when a lion does something like that. They don't have any sense of empathy for the distress of something that they're trying to eat. That said, there are examples, of course, of lions adopting young chemspok, young oryx, and young um, leopards adopting young baboons. So, although yesterday, certainly, that zebra was, had anything but a sense of empathy extended to it by these lions, she's looking at something there. Let's just watch and see. Oh, it's a tortoise. Brian, she's, she's spotted a tortoise there. So as we watch that tortoise going, I don't think, I think she's probably going to leave it alone. Unfortunately, it would be quite fun to go and watch them play with it. They wouldn't be able to uh, sort of get into the shell, but it's quite amusing to watch them play with tortoises. Um, yeah, she's gone back to sleep, put her feet up. So they will extend a sense of empathy towards young animals sometimes, and I think that's a kind of universal mammal thing. It's a fa we could sit and talk about and debate this for, of course, for months. But I think it's a fascinating topic. Thank you, Robbie, for that. Now. That lioness just had a bad dream, that's why she sat up like that. I didn't do anything strange. And just to give you an update on Scott, uh, he's not in fact shirking his responsibilities. Uh, he's in fact helping Brent Leo Smith. Now Brent Leo Smith is on leave. While he's on leave, he's doing a bit of guiding. He's guiding at Juma at the moment, and he's managed to get his car stuck. And Scott wouldn't allow Nikki to link to the scene of Brent Leo Smith, because Brent Leo Smith, of course, will tell you that he's never got a car stuck in his life. Now you know, I've tattletailed on him that he has got stuck. I, of course, get vehicles more stuck than I have hot breakfasts. Now here's another classic example of what we were looking at. Here's Jamie's question, and it's not Jamie Patterson. We think it's a new viewer, which is wonderful. Thank you, Jamie, for your question. A very nice one. And it's got a lot to do with, you know, we're chatting about this empathy that extended to that hapless zebra foal last night. You want to know if they'll extend that empathy to, them, to each other. If one of them becomes injured, will they wait around and feed it and help it? Absolutely not. You don't want to become sick aged or infirm in lion society, you will be left to fend for yourself. You will probably be killed by hyenas. So, no, there's nothing egalitarian about the society. It's completely unlike a wolf or wild dog pack where a sick or injured animal will be looked after and fed. Not like that in the lions at all. And that's, I mean, obviously we think that they're wonderful animals, but in terms of our ability to identify with their way of life, and this is what anthropomorphism is. We try and impress our emotions on them and see and try and derive some kind of connection from them. Do they feel the same as we do in certain situations so that we can try and understand how they live? Lions is actually very little similar and that's why a lot of people are so attached to wild dogs and wolves because they do have this kind of um, similar similarity to us in the way they operate and the way their society works as an egalitarian or sympathetic society which is how we want our society to be. It isn't always, of course. <laughs> oh, marvelous question from Hawaii, Aqua in Honolulu. Aqua in Honolulu, uh, 
Aloha to you too, of Shen, as we'd say in Shangan. If you want to know appropriately, you have greeted us in your local language, and I have done so in the local language here. And you want to know if I think lions have different cultures from place to place. Do they have a different way of living? Um, that's an interesting one. I haven't thought about it before, but I suppose, in a way, they do. You know, they would specialize in different things in different parts of Africa, and they would, would I suppose, have slightly different interactions with the local, uh, you know, where the fauna and flora are different. They will have a different relationship with that. Local variation in behavior, which in turn, I suppose, might be interpreted as culture. That's a very interesting question. Um, I don't think it would be anything like as noticeable as it would be with us. So, I mean, while I'm sitting here in Southern Africa, I could very easily go up and um, tell a story about an East African pride, fairly sure in the knowledge that they would behave in a similar way to they do here. Hang on, what's going on here? Now, Mekelo was completely unable not to just quickly flash you across to Brent stuck in the mud there. I'm glad she did that. I hope you didn't miss any of the question there, Aqua in Honolulu. But now she's whetted your appetite. I'm sure you'd love to see. Wouldn't you love to see Brent digging his car out with Scott helping him? And Brent, of course, making any number of excuses for the vehicle's too heavy or the tires are too bold or, you know, Toyotas aren't as good as Land Rovers or I'm not used to this long wheel, but it'll be a litany. It will be a litany of excuses. You should definitely go across and have a look. Let me try and convince Nicola to send you across there. <laughs> He's just got out. <laughs> so I'm going to link you across to Scott. He can interview Brent for you and uh, find out from Brent why it is that he got stuck. And bear in mind, I, of course, make no bones about the fact that I will get stuck more than anyone else. You can see Brent over there is trying to sneak away after getting <laughs> snuck. And at least he's made his way out there as his happy guests. <laughs> I came round the corner only to see a whole bunch of guests standing by the side of their vehicle with the other side of the vehicle and he was busy working the high level jack and at that stage David and I became hysterical with laughter because Brent had been very quiet about the fact that he had been stuck his last was that he was spending some time with elephants while Jamie and Fan, while his tracker were off on foot following up on the monkey's alarm calls. We are also busy following up. The story is that he could have avoided being stuck had he have just turned the vehicle's diff lock on. He wouldn't have had to jack the vehicle up. He wouldn't have had to put sticks under the tires. He's blamed it on Fanwell. He says Fanwell didn't put the flock on. <laughs> the lions, everyone. I'm sorry you had to leave Scott like that. The signal on Rusty in that area is a little bit dodgy, of course. And it seems to be affected by the clouds, which I think is quite interesting. Absolutely no idea why that should be the case. But anyway, now, there was a lion and leopard herd calling a little bit earlier. That's sort of in that direction there. So we're going to go across there and see if we can find some tracks. We just desperately don't want to run over the tortoise that we saw scuttling along here, although scuttling is a strong word for what the tortoise was doing. So we've turned around, and now we're going to go back past the lions. And we will 
make our way to where that leopard was crawling a little bit earlier on. The lions are now on the left hand side. Right now, the tortoise is a very speedily absconded, isn't it? Mm. Mm. I wonder the lions can think about going to get it. Bye, black lions. Shannon, you're in Ohio, and you ask a very good question, and it is one of the unique features, of course, of lion activity. You want to know if they are, two of them are pregnant, would they go away together to have cubs? Um, they probably wouldn't go away together necessarily, because they'll give birth sort of separately, but they will definitely cross-suckle each other's cubs, and so that's why it's quite a good idea for them to have cubs at the same time as each other. So that all the cubs will be able to suckle from any female that is lactating, which makes success-wise chances of success much stronger. Very few animals will do that. Hyenas will not do that. So if a hyena cub loses its mother, for example, it will die. It will not be allowed to suckle from the other lactating females. And the same cannot be said for lions. Elephants will adopt youngsters, which I think is, of course, elephants have the most I suppose human-like sense of an um, egalitarian spirit, if you like. I'm just going to ease our way out of here. There we go. Should be all right now. Now they're not are very interested in how, what the survival rate of lions are and what the survival rate of all the cubs out here are. And lions, probably less than one in ten, no, it's about one in ten males will make it to adulthood to own a, to hold a territory. And females, of course, have a much less risky life. So probably about, only, probably only three or four in ten will make it to adulthood within a pride to breed themselves. So it's not a very high rate of success at all. Leopards, probably slightly more, uh, probably one in eight males maybe, uh, but not much more than that. And I would say about the same for females. Three or four females in ten will make it to adulthood to own a territory and raise cubs of their own. Hyena's probably a lot more successful. Now we're just going to slowly drive around here. the ground here there are a couple of sort of uh, hyena tracks around the place and Michelle you're in Michigan and you want to know about whether or not lions create a den when they have youngsters do they stay with the pride they, get, they do create a den but it's not a den like the hyenas then they will go away from the pride in much the same way as a leopard will they'll find a hollow in a log or perhaps a cave in a dry riverbed they'll give birth there or it might even be in some very thick bush uh, often in a riverbed, and they'll give birth there, and then they introduce the cubs to the pride normally at around six weeks. And otherwise, they're co totally alone. I even I think if two of them are pregnant together, I don't think that they will give birth together. I think they go away and they do that alone. I'm not entirely sure if that's true, but I'm pretty sure it is. Now, I'm just watching the ground for signs of leopard tracks. Of course, a leopard will move in, on a day like this. It's not hot, and leopards are much more likely to move during the day than lions are. So we'll look on top of the termite mounds. We'll check in the boughs of the trees to see if there isn't a draped stenbok or diker being devoured by the spotted cat of Africa, which would be a wonderful way to continue our afternoon. That buffalo, of course, not too far away from these lions, probably only about 80 meters as the crow, maybe 100 meters as the crow flies. So he'll want to watch out for them. The wind is blowing from him to them, so he won't smell them. He won't know that they're where they are. Now, and one of the Lee and you, interesting question, you 
are wondering about the sort of relationship of wild dogs and lions. And is there any chance of a wild dog pack attacking a single lioness? No, I really don't think so. I think that one of the leading causes of wild dog death are lions. They will try and avoid lions at just about every cost. So, no, I don't think they'd bother. I don't think they'd stay away. One swat from a lion's paw could kill a dog, break its back, certainly break a limb, and maybe even break a neck. So I think they'll be very careful of staying away from lions. Even as a, even as a pack, it's really not a great thing for them to be anywhere near lions. Hyenas might. In fact, hyenas definitely would. A lot of hyenas would, but not wild dogs. question from um, Eric in Virginia Beach. Eric, a regular contributor. Thank you again, Eric, for getting hold of us. And we did a lovely drive yesterday afternoon before the main drive for a school in Virginia Beach, which was great fun. Um, Eric, you want to know, you say that uh, lions or predators, can, animals can smell adrenaline, and therefore can they basically smell fear? Would they be able to smell the fear that a human being has uh, if even during the day, and would that induce an attack? Um, no, it, w it wouldn't. I mean, if you ran away from a lion, it may well induce an attack. But there's no question that even the conflict situations, so even if you're not afraid of lions at all normally, if you came across a lion on foot, I guarantee you your adrenaline levels would spike. Does that induce a charge? Absolutely not. I don't know that the animals notice it at all, I'm not sure that it's a smelling of adrenaline so much as that it's a sense of your body language that they're worried about. So no, I don't think that they would react at all. Because, I mean, every time I've seen lions on foot and they've stood up in front of me, obviously the adrenaline does spike. But that doesn't make them uh, any more likely to have a go at us. Now, this is where Steph heard the leopard calling earlier today. So we're going to watch closely for some tracks on the ground, check the termite mounds for spotted signs. And while we try and find this leopard uh, sign thereof, we're really not sure exactly where Steph heard calling from. Uh, let's head across to Scott. He seems to have a bit more signal. Get an update of his plans, and I'll keep you posted. Apologies for our break in signal as David and myself were perusing the Mulwati in the hope of finding the leopard that was causing these monkeys to alarm call. Now, a lot of you would have just met Kathy, who's a first time Safari Live go, and Deb, thank you for inviting her along. Kathy, um, you are interested to know what exactly is an alarm call. And let's stop here and just watch these. There's a few little wattled starlings that took off, but they were hopping around next to this mighty Cape buffalo, and they're pretty birds that we don't get to see too often, so hopefully they'll come back down. Kathy, basically an alarm call is a sound made by uh, various animals, monkeys, baboons, all manner of birds, all manner of antelope, if and when they see any predators. Now, the predator can be a snake, it can be a lion, it could be a leopard, it can be a false alarm. It can be a whole host of different possible prey. Squirrels will be another great animal that helps us to find animals like leopard and lions when they alarm call. The monkey's alarm calls that Brents would have heard would have sounded something like this. And something important to remember when you hear the sound is you need to rush into that area because naturally any animal that has been caught and here is an alarm going off, no different to a human burglar, I guess, is going to think about running and getting out of there before all the authorities come and work out what's what and then have to deal with the paperwork. And it's the same for leopard and lion. You'll tend to find that they try and slink away from any alarm calls or any animals that may be alarm calling at them. That's why I raced into this area. Brent also would have had his pedal to the metal, 
trying to get you, and he did get to the monkeys in time, and he found them, he saw them, and the monkeys, what they do is they'll climb right up to the tops of trees, so they've got the best possible vantage point, and also be probably the safe, in the safest possible place, high as off the ground as possible, and they were looking in a specific direction, and that's the direction that Jamie and Fanwell Brent's tracker uh, for, for, for his guests over this period have headed off on foot, checking in an easterly direction where those monkeys were looking. So it's a critical way of finding animals, and it emphasizes the, the fact that your situational awareness, your awareness of your surroundings out here is critical when it comes to trying to find animals. I'm just gonna try and get another angle of this big old cape. Buffalo, you can see he's scratching his behind the ear there, and this is why I wanted to get to a different angle. Look, he's lost half of his horn, his left horn, and that would have been from the horn borer moth. It's a highly specialized insect that can feed on and process keratin, unlike most other animals. And we've just got a comment through from Penelope saying that she's just worked out why exactly there's certain animals alarm calling at her house whenever the hawk flies over. So Penelope, I'm happy that your safari live tricks of the trade are helping you work out what the animals in your own backyard are doing and probably also helping you to locate more predators, even if they are hawks and eagles. Interesting stuff, so thanks for that feedback, Penel Penelope. And well done for your situational awareness. This is my friend, Frederick the Fly. He spends a lot of time with me. He's got uh, quite a few stunt doubles, so sometimes there'll be two or three of them on me at any given point of time. There's a screenshot that one of you got. I think I've got like 10 or 12 flies uh, on my face. We must try and see if we can beat that record. It takes a, a large amount of skill, I like to say, to be able to remain composed while flies jiggle and waltz all over your face because it's incredibly ticklish, especially the spot that this one's in now under my eye. Oh, it's ticklish. <laughs> anyway, enough, Frederick. <laughs> If you get enough of them on you at one time and they kind of do the simultaneous moonwalk, it almost short circuits your body into this cold shiver, which can stop you midway through a sentence. That's why I'm trying to train myself to be fly proof, Frederick proof. So, I think James has made the right decision by leaving the Inkahuma ladies and going off in search of the leopard that Stefan heard calling at about 10 o'clock today. And it's been a busy day for us at the Safari Life Camp. We're doing some kind of feedback meetings, overlooking some of the drives this morning, uh, trying to learn from one another's performances, both negative and positive. So we had a little critique meeting. All the people involved, the presenters, the cameramen, the directors, everyone kind of just sharing ideas and giving feedback to one another. So we did that to start off the morning after the sunrise safari. And then after we've been practicing saving lives, doing a first aid course, just to kind of revamp, which is great stuff that we are doing this to upkeep that. Texas, you have asked a question that I'm sure many, many people are wondering about, and that is why do buffaloes have these gigantic scrotums, and inside the gigantic scrotum is a gigantic pair of testicles? I do not know. Uh, no different to cows, I guess. Uh, but you're right, I mean, they're ginormous, and you speculate that they may need to uh, use a lot of sperm to fertilize their ladies. Uh, that would be feasible, I guess. Big f sperm factories to deliver lots of sperm. Uh, quite possible. Um, they seem like they just can't do anything else but obviously make a lot of sperm and get in the way. Um, I'm not too sure, though, but I'm glad you asked that question because somebody may know the answer to that question. Franklin just took off out of this bush in a great hurry. 
but I can still see one hidden in there. It's incredibly well camouflaged, so I'm not even going to suggest that Dave try and find it. But I think what was happening was a little altercation between Franklin. So often, and um, Kathy, we often also, that, that sound we just heard there was an alarm call. It was one Franklin being alarmed by another. But I think that it was because these Franklin were fighting, not because they had seen any possible threats. It was a intraspecies alarm. The Franklin Kathy is a, basically like a chicken-like animal. Spends a lot of time on the ground. Something like a, a grouse. Oh, fantastic. Uh, James has apparently got some answers for you uh, regarding the mega testicles of the Cape Buffalo. So you're just going to have to wait. I know it's going to be difficult until he's... You guys jump back on his vehicle, but at least you are going to hear some news about that. <laughs> Hello, Bree and Marilyn. I'm very glad that you like my friend Frederick the Fly. Some people don't, so very happy to hear you. You don't mind him. Um, kind words. You're wondering a little bit about the Cape Buffalo and, and uh, when they do lose that horn due to the horn borer moths making it weak and brittle, is it painful for the buffalo? And yes, I, th I, I, I certainly think it is, but it depends on how far up or down the horn it breaks. So in that buffalo's uh, instance, it didn't look like it would have got to the kind of root of the horn or the, the, the nerve endings of the horn. Um, so I don't think in that specific scenario, and I'm, I'm stressing the word, I don't think, it would have been too painful. Um, it's more kind of uh, embarrassing, you could say. He's not going to be as confident as he was. He doesn't have that same beautiful full rack. So he may feel a little bit self-conscious, or he may not be able to fight as well. But sometimes, Brie, you do see horns literally dripping with blood that have got the uh, kind of nerve endings exposed, and that certainly must be very, very painful. So I think it depends on the individual circumstance. Sometimes it will hurt the buffalo, and other times it will not. to cats in Tampa who says, wow, that buffalo looked really old and a little bit worse for wear. And you're right, cats, he, he did. And most buffaloes do look a little bit worse for wear. Um, so, sorry, hang on. Most buffaloes on Juma look a little bit worse for wear. And that is because they're all big, old, basically retired bulls, pensioners, you could say, um, that are just going easy, taking it slowly, enjoying their, their last few years on the planet. They don't move huge distances. They don't have to run after the ladies and worry about all the kids. They just do their own thing. So that's the case at the moment. So unless you're seeing herds uh, with young and with females, there you'll see bulls that are more in their prime. But on Juma at the moment, we, we, we're not seeing many herds. And therefore, basically every bull you see will be varying degrees of old. But he was looking exceptionally worse. We had a very kind of white and gray face. But let's not forget that age may also be slightly kind of uh, it, it, well, due to the drought, I think we may be misled into thinking one animal is older than it is because it's simply malnourished at the moment. It's a tough time of, of year for the herbivores in the middle of this drought. So, a combination of things. And now your pain and suffering of waiting to hear the finer story of why the Cape Buffalo has gigantic testicles is going to be answered along with an avian species that James has found for you. Enjoy. Now, of course, the discussion of or the topic under discussion at the moment 
He's not relevant to those two birds there. They are two species of birds, though. There's one called a magpie shrike and the other a red-billed buffalo weaver just behind. You'll see Brian with tremendous skill pulling the focus between the two birds. And there we are on the magpie shrike, so named for its piebald color. Now, pied means black and white. Our birds don't have anything like the impressive set of testicles that that buffalo does. And the question as to why a mammal would have enormous testicles, and there are some, sorry, there were some dwarf mongrels there. I don't think, I don't think you can see them properly. Um, it's quite an interesting one, I think. We're just going to stop here and listen a bit because there were, this is a roundabout where we supposedly had those leopard calling earlier. Now, it is very interesting that you can actually predict an, a mammal's social structure from the size of their testicles. Now, I know that sounds totally astonishing and totally bizarre to many of you, but it's not actually when you think about it. And I'm going to use the human being as the most obvious example and our closest relative. So, a, for example, a chimpanzee has got an enormous set of testicles as well, possibly not quite as impressive as those buffalo, but relative to its size, probably more so. Now, chimpanzees have a completely, um, what, what would we say, non-monogamous situation where they, if all, all of them will mate with everyone else. And what that does, of course, is it confuses paternity. So nobody knows who the father is. But what it means is that the larger the testicles you have, of course, the greater the chance you have of impregnating a female. Because, of course, if you make more sperm, then there's a greater chance that your sperm will reach the egg and you'll then produce a youngster. At the opposite end of the scale is a gorilla. A gorilla which lives in a harem structure where only one male will mate with the females has got tiny little testicles in comparison with his size. So there's a very dis great distinction there. Now, the human being sits somewhere in between. We have got um, relatively large testicles compared to the gorilla, much smaller than a chimpanzee. Now, we are nominally monogamous. We know that we are, uh, we, um, in most cases, claim to be monogamous, but we also know that we are tend to philandering as well. And that's completely within, in keeping with our, with the size of what our testicles would pre would um, predict, which I think is fascinating. Now, if you look at a squirrel, of course, out here, they have got absolutely astonishingly sized undercarriages. And I suspect you will find there that there is no monogamy in a squirrel society at all. And I suspect everybody's running around trying to mate with as many females as possible. So if next time you see an animal with, which has enormous testicles, you can basically assume, just like with a buffalo, that when they live in a herd, there's a very probably a, a very unstructured dominance, society, dominance hierarchy over mating. And if there is a dominance hierarchy, you'll find that you get lots of males who will come in from the side, try and mate quickly, and then get out again. And that will predict uh, very large testicles. And I hope that answers the great mystery of the big balls. Let us continue along to that slightly awkward subject and look at a warthog, which is just up ahead here. Well, it was up ahead. Oh, and I think there's a buffalo there. I don't think we're going to go and look at that buffalo. Disgust them enough, I feel. In fact, there might be a whole herd there. We're going hither and yon, to and fro, up and down. Let's just pop along there. There were some just at the far end of the road there, at least two. So let's go and have a look. Maybe more than just the two of them. Maybe a large herd. So beautiful weather. As I know the light is flat, but the weather is just wonderful for us at the moment. Like I say, it's been so very hot this summer. And to have a bit of cloud like this, although I have to say, and I'm going to ask Brian what he thinks about this, I find my mood is slightly subdued when the when the clouds over the sky. Brian, I don't know what you feel. Mm, potentially, I I'll definitely have to feel. Like on a sunny day. Hmm? I'll have to check what it's like yes. on a sunny day. I'm definitely happier on a sunny day, although of course I'm sweating more profusely. But I do find after two days of this, although my body is infinitely more comfortable, I find my psychology is just slightly off. And it is no surprise to me, of course, that uh, people who live in England and 
and other cloudy places of the world uh, just feel so much happiness when the sun comes out. Ashley, you're in England while we're looking at this purple roller and we were talking about buffalo and you've read about wide buffalo horns and the fact that they tend to be a lot more valuable and you know you've been asked you're asking do we still get those wide horned buffalo in this area I've uh, this whole game breeding malarkey that goes on in South Africa to me is a it's a bizarre thing to me and uh, buffalo for example I think the what did it go for with that one buffalo went for about 30 million rand the mm. other day a, a buffalo bull was sold for 30 million rand on the basis of the fact that he had very wide horns now that to me is about as nonsensical as buying an animal simply because it has got big feet or it's got a heavy tail or it's perhaps got well, big testicles for example the reason it has that value is because we've attached that value to it, Ashley, and we've attached that value to it because we're now selectively breeding buffalo to have enormous horns. So you will find that it's got to the extent now where those enormously horned buffalo probably don't occur in the wild, simply because they never occurred in the wild. You get the odd big horned buffalo, but it doesn't actually in bring any kind of a breeding advantage to that buffalo. It's probably actually more of a hindrance to have a giant set of horns that weighs your head down. It doesn't make them any more good at defending themselves, I don't believe, or maybe it does to a certain extent. But once you pass a certain level, it just becomes ridiculous. And this whole business of breeding buffalo and then selling them on because they have big horns i think is going to result in a lot of people losing a lot of money one day because eventually somebody's going to stand up and say but hang on what's the point of all of this and everybody's going to go oh yeah and then suddenly those buffalo are going to be worth nothing the only thing that they are worth or the only people that will pay for buffalo like that are breeders and of course once they are, what are they breeding them for no ways that somebody starting a game reserve is going to desperately want big horned buffalo over small ones. Absolutely, he's going to want disease-free ones, but not big horned ones. And I mean, unfortunately, this is all, to my mind, heading towards the hunters. The hunters want big horned buffalo because that, of course, means that they get these records that they hunting fraternity um, consider important if you shoot a buffalo that's got very wide horns and you're much cleverer than somebody who shoots a buffalo with, with smaller horns. Um, and so they bred for these enormous big horns and I think that it's going to pop. I, I just don't believe there's that much hunting going on and so yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a false industry in my opinion actually. I think it was just two bulls, actually. I just saw their dung on the ground there. Oh, there's one in front of us. I'm not sure that there's a whole herd here. Now, Sharon, here's a beef. Hello, beefy. You're being very confiding to us. Isn't he wonderful? Sharon, you're in Michigan. You want to know if this is a Cape buffalo or an African buffalo. Sharon, it's the same thing. I mean, no, it's not actually the same thing. I mean, an African buffalo could refer to a forest buffalo or one of these buffalo. They're actually the same species, different subspecies. And this one, doing great credit to his subspecies, the Cape buffalo, is having a, well, a toilet break in the middle of the road which he hasn't quite finished, but that hasn't disturbed him moving on. Thank you, Brian. Just uh, reiterating what we were talking about earlier, the impressively sized testicles. And interestingly, in buffalo, they aren't always like that, you know. They do sometimes atrophy. 
and they go sort of up and shrivel up internally and I think that happens with old buffalo because to maintain of course those impressive things there is energetically expensive and if the buffalo is not going to breed anymore if it is too old to breed then there's no point in maintaining those enormous things and so they will kind of shrivel up and atrophy okay. Brian, I don't want to see any more buffalo boys Now on the boundary between Arathusa and Juma, and we're just going to see if perhaps that leopard that called earlier, that Steph heard, wasn't maybe shadow coming across, either going to or from Wuertel or Juma, maybe because it was a sort of rainyish day yesterday. Oh, this is the whole herd in here. It's a whole herd of, what is it? It's just buffalo bulls. It's just a lot of buffalo bulls here. Drive slowly past. I think it's just a great big herd of bulls. Anyway, we'll see if we can find some leopard tracks as we go along the road here. Doesn't have that feeling. Right, let's go across to Scott for an update. I, this road is a bit bumpy. We'll catch you once we've turned back into Juma. So I'm glad that James could shed some more light on that matter. And Bill, I hope you're now happy with that explanation. I'm looking forward to cornering James around the campfire this evening and getting him to regale exactly what he told you. We've done a loop around back onto Ledwood Road um, in the hope that we can find any further sign of whatever those monkeys were <coughs> alarm calling at. And we've just spotted two birds. Had I not known this area as well as I do, I would be very excited by the sight of these battalures because they are very good indicators for the chance of their being carrying around. Now, because I do know this area well, I know that this pair lives here. This is their home. The male is on the left and the female is on the right. You can see her bottom kind of trailing edge of her wing has got a big white panel, whereas his is dark. And I'm going to get my book out shortly to show you exactly how they do look. A bit close up, we're a bit far away, and Dave is at full zoom. But yeah, this is their, their local hangout, and I don't think there is Great any meat nearby. So let's have a look in the book here, um, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by the, the male and females having different kind of trailing edges of their wings. Here's the female. You can see that gray wing panel that I pointed out. Gray, white. Uh, gray, I think, is a better description for the color there, not white. And here's the male being black. Now, in flight, you can also see that. Here's the female, predominantly white. Very easy to remember. The lady dressed in a white wedding dress. And the male, half black, half white, in a tuxedo. Very good. So, easy to distinguish male and female bachelor. Aren't they incredibly pretty birds? Bright red face and beaks. And Latin names will not always uh, mean something that kind of makes sense, but they often do, so it can be quite useful to actually understand the Latin name. In this case, Terathopius equidatus means beautiful. Let's see if we can get this one on the, th on the thing for you. There you go, it's a bit of a mouthful. Terathopius equidatus means beautiful face, short tail in Latin. They don't always make perfect sense, but that's a good example of a nice one. So just to keep you guys in the loop as to where the monkeys were alarm calling, it was down in a riverbed, the Mawati riverbed, which is down to our right, not very far away. And apparently Brent did see the monkeys looking in an easterly direction. So the leopard was east 
of the riverbed where the monkeys were. Here's something quite interesting. In the termite mound on our left here, I wish we could get a little bit closer, but we aren't going to be able to, but you will still be able to understand what this bird is doing. It's a red-billed hornbill, and it's busy feeding on termites. Not the regular termites that they like to... Oh, it looks like it had a soldier there. You may have seen it. it was a very large termite, another big one, and they've got big pincers, so you're going to see it's going to make sure that it crushes and kills those before it actually feeds on them. Look at how big that is. That's the soldiers trying to protect the mound from this invasion. But that hornbill is having a great time. And they do provide huge amounts of protein for large amounts of birds as well as other animals in this area. It's usually the reproductive termites, though, the winged elates that creates all the fuss and creates all the food. But this hornbill is now taking on some soldiers. It's going to get very hot standing at that chimney. A very warm, moist air will be rising up there. And on cold mornings, you can actually see birds like hornbills sitting there, not for food, but merely for warmth. And the reason why the termites will be uh, what's the, the right word? Ejecting hot air is not the right word, but expelling hot air, rather, is because of the chemical, not the chemical reaction, the kind of the reaction going down as their fungus is broken down, their dung, sorry, is broken down into a fungus. I am making an absolute meal of this. I think that's because I didn't get my usual midday siesta today. But basically, what's happening is, these are fungus-growing termites that live within this mound, okay? And they actually farm fungus on their feces. And the, the, the reaction given off from that gives off heat as the fungus breaks down their feces into something that is more palatable for the termites to then feed on. And that hot air is then ejected out of the chimneys. And depending on how, uh, re how the, the termites need to regulate the temperature within that mound, they'll either open or close the chimneys accordingly. So an intricate system going on in there. And what's even more interesting is that we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg here. You'll probably find that the network of tunnels, fungus growing uh, chambers underground, is probably about 80% larger than what we can see here as an average rule. So a whole other ecosystem and world is occurring under there. And vitally important, because these termites and these termite mounds are responsible for breaking down dead plant matter that is basically unpalatable by most other species. It's gone past that stage of being nutritional, and that's why even the termites need to farm this specific fungus on their feces pellets of what they've already fed on to even further break it down. I hope that made sense eventually, but I did make an absolute hash of it to, to start with. So apologies for that. Mr. Moustache, and you would like to know what animals, if any, will mate for life, be monogamous for life in the bush. And this, I think we need to uh, just specify one thing in your question. A lot will mate for, for as long as feasibly possible, but if they lose a mate, they may find a replacement. So, yes, they do mate for life, but come the time that they are unfortunate enough to lose a partner that, that they will find another one. Um, and there's quite a few of them. A lot of the eagles and birds of prey are monogamous. Those bachelors you'll probably find have been hooking up for many years now. Um, some of the antelope are monogamous. Diker, Steenbuck. So they will be monogamous. What else? What am I not thinking of? What am I not thinking clearly about you? Mainly birds, but some of the antelope species. Other than that, I can't think of too
too many others. But there are certainly a couple, mainly birds are the ones that are coming to mind. Hmm. But none of the, the mammals, or none of the major mammals that I can think of, none of the big five or magnificent seven uh, will mate for life. So none of the high profile games, so to speak. But some of the smaller antelope will be monogamous. And the birds. That's just about all I have got for you, Dave, sadly. I'm probably forgetting one or two, so I'm trying to rack my brain here. But I'm not coming up with anything. So we need to keep focus now. This is the area where the monkeys were alarm calling. The leopard could be far from here now, or it could just be lurking on any under any of these bushes, on any of the termite mounds we drive past, in any of the marula trees. So help scan with me. And as we scan the bushes around us, Travel Nut would like to know how far is Mala Mala away from us here? And not far at all. I'd probably say, probably say as the crow flies, two miles, if that, to the northern boundary of Mala Mala. And I'm told that that is an incredible property within the Savi Sands. They've got uh, a lot of river frontage and a lot of land that is highly productive. So. I'm told there is great game viewing there. So I'm sure you had a good time when you went there. But the whole Savi Sands is varying degrees of wonderful. So that's also important to remember. Paul Rizzo, you have inquired as to whether the wild dogs don't fall into that monogamous mating for life category. And no, they don't. Even though there will be an alpha pair at any point in time, it will, it, they will not be monogamous. They will not stay together as that set pair for life. And you may find that the alpha male will also mate with the beta female. So you're not going to get a beta pair. You're just going to get a beta female. The, the male is going to be doing all the mating. So. Uh, I don't think that counts, but thank you for suggesting that one. Also, they, they, they will not stay the alpha pair from the start of the pack's existence to the end of the pack's existence. They'll, they'll just, you know, there'll be two or three years maybe when they are the alphas and then they'll be overthrown and there'll be another alpha pair, either the male, and it's not necessarily going to be a pair that's ousted, an alpha male may be ousted by another male, leaving the alpha female no other choice than to mate with the new male. So, dot is dot. <laughs> Hello, Isabella, who is no longer four. She is five years old. Well done, Isabella, and very happy to hear that you're growing up to be a big girl. And you're wondering if I'm not worried about the flies landing in my eyes or flying into my nose. That's usually not the problem. It's very ticklish when they walk on my face, so that's the most difficult thing. But the one place that they can get inside is uh, into your mouth. And it's happened to a few of us on a few times where, oh, next thing you know, there's a fly all the way down your throat and you're coughing and spluttering. I actually found one the other day and got it on my finger. It had drowned, sadly, somewhere in my throat. Um, but swallowing flies is what you don't want to do, Isabella. I haven't had any crawling into my nose yet. Um, once when I was on, ca on camera on the bushwalk with Steph, when Steph was doing the bushwalks, when was it? Halfway through last year. Um, the bushwalk cameramen have got a very tricky job because they've got their backpack on and they've also got both hands on the camera, which means if a fly lands on you and you're alive, 
There is nothing you can do. And there was one in my ear going inside my ear. And I was just stuck there while Steph was live trying to keep the focus. So that was also uh, uh, an interesting scenario that happened with flies, Isabella. <laughs> And I think it's Christy in Indiana is wondering if I'm not worried about those flies laying eggs on me. You know what, if they did lay eggs in me, Christina, um, it, it wouldn't be the greatest of problems. Even if they hatched, a maggot would have no... It wouldn't have too much fun on my face. There's nothing really for it to do there. There's no decaying flesh for it to feed on. Um, and I'd like to think that I shower regularly enough to prevent the eggs having enough time to hatch. But I guess they could deposit, oh, what was that? Deposit a few eggs on my face, but I'm not too concerned. I'm just going to reverse and just see if we can't get an angle of what that was. Oh, it was a bigger rock that I drove into. Have a look at that. We don't see many rocks here, though. This is worth showing. There we go, check that rock out. That's what we hit. That's why it surprised me, because, like I said, we don't see rocks too often, so I'm sure a lot of you will be jumping for joy that, I, that we showed you that. I remember James spends a whole drive searching for a rock and eventually did it a very impressive reveal. <laughs> so, the road that we've been driving along is called Leadwood Road, and this is the tree that the road was named after. Even though it is dead, <laughs> and probably even was dead when the Nade, the Nade was road, when the road was named, um, and that's not a problem because these trees stand for hundreds of years once they've died. As their name suggests, Leadwood, they're incredibly resilient, heavy, hard woods. So I don't think any time soon they're going to have to worry about renaming this road. Even if a fire came through, they're almost fire resistant to a degree. To a degree. Deborah, the armchair traveler. I'm just going to stop here and answer your question before we disappear down into this dip. Um, I hope all is well in the Big Apple, Deborah. You've brought up a very good uh, theory and question, uh, and I hope you are right, and I hope this does happen. You've suggested that because we're having an incredibly dry season now, is there not a chance that during our regular dry season, our winter, and now it's, sorry, for those of you who are new to the show and, and, and to being on safari in South Africa, it's typically our rainy season now, but as you can see, it's dry and dusty. We're in a drought. Now, Deborah is suggesting that there's going to be a kind of a swap and that our dry season is going to be wet. And hopefully that is the case. It is possible El Nino is renowned for doing that. And it is the results of this weather phenomenon called El Nino that does cause certain areas to get rain when it's not supposed to and others areas to be dry when it's not supposed to be dry. So let's hope that happens. Of course, it's not going to be a sure fix, Deborah, because... If it's cold, which it, it still will be in the winter, it will not have the same amount of sunshine every day. We're not going to have the, the same amount of photosynthesizing opportunities for the plants to grow, but of course the moisture will help. Um, and there is enough warmth during our winter. It's not, a, it's not a stark contrast to our summer in terms, well, it is a big contrast in terms of temperature, but it's still a pleasant enough environment for things to grow. But it's not going to be like a regular summer, I guess regarding temperature and daylight. But whatever water we can get will certainly help the plants. Ooh, we're in luck. If 
you see there's two birds, Dave, just sitting on that dead branch. It's kind of just up there. I don't want to move too far forward. No, 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 at the end of my finger there. Just go to the air. Oh, it just took off. Let me creep a little bit forward. There we go. Oh, the one just took off. They should go back and land there, though, Dave. So if you just stay on that branch where I left you, they're going to land back there. If you zoom out, then a little bit to the right. There we go. It's already landed back there. There we go. Um, these are the carmine bee eaters. I don't know why this one's lacking a trail, tail streamer, or maybe it was just the angle it was sitting at. They're incredibly fast flying birds, but there we go. Back again. You may be able to notice a slight pink tinge to them. It's this flat light that's causing us to not be able to see their true beauty. There we go. That is the carmine bee eater, though. They are doing their thing. I'm just going to go a little bit further forward and see if Dave can't try and follow them as they do their thing. Let's see if they are. They, I don't know what they're feeding on, but there is a lot of whatever it is that they're flying around every few seconds to catch. They are wonderful, wonderful birds in terms of their aviation skills and can flitter and flutter from side to side at incredible speeds. That one's got the tail streamer. And look at them go. It's such a pity the lighting's terrible, but the air display that we're seeing, sorry, Dave, I just crept forward there without warning you, but now you've got more, more sky and less branches in your way. Look at how quickly they can maneuver, Dave. Great work on camera there. And while you keep watching them flitter about, doing their thing, I'm going to pull my phone and find some pictures of them that are going to do them a little bit of justice. It would be good fun to be a bird. Just fly around all day. Oh, oh, no. Let me enough of the, the aerial display and the signal's no good in here, so let's get out of here. And then So, I'm going to start off with the regular kind of pictures of them. These are all drawings, so not giving you the real idea of what they look like. But these are photographs, and now you get a much better idea of just how brightly colored they are when the sunlight is correct. Isn't that awesome? Oh, that guy did well. A Froneman, good picture, captured in Namibia. What's it eating? A little butterfly, it looks like. Uh, J. Carleon, not such a bright specimen, but I guess good to show the individual. Nice pick. Oh, interesting, the juvenile here has got a little tinge of blue before it gets the pink. Oh, jackpots! Imagine, look at that. Epic. So they nest in banks in riverbeds, so those ones behind us could well be nesting in the banks of the Mulwati somewhere behind us. There's an, a lot more nesting in a termite mound, it looks like. So not a vertical banks of the ground, of, of a riverbed, but kind of uh, more, sorry, not horizontal, vertical banks, but ho uh, horizontal holes. Now these are going to be uh, horizontal bank and vertical holes, if that makes any sense. Whew. I am making a meal of the Sunset Safari and testament to the fact that sleep is very important and if you don't get it, the brain battles to operate as it should. Thankfully though, James is going to relieve me and I will no longer be continuing to make a fool of myself. See you later. We 
we are here, everyone, at the scene of the crime from yesterday, where the zebra was killed just around here. As, look, there are a few birds. There was a tawny eagle that flew out of here. Then there was a battalier that did the same thing. And I'm just trying to see, I can't actually see exactly where the crime went down. Somewhere around here. Just in here, that's right, we parked here. We parked through there like that. Oh, you can see exactly where it was now. But obviously things have been moved around a bit and there's nothing left. There's a roller there. Let's stop here and I'll just have a walk around. Can you see something? Stomach contents. Uh, the stomach contents are definitely there. Right. Now, this is where the zebra met its unfortunately early end as a young animal. And I can smell... Oh, here we go. Here is some bone stuff. Can you still hear me, do you think, Brian? Mm, hopefully. Here is a bone. And this is what the batelier would have been feeding on. Now, I am... Unlike Brent, not quite prepared to pick up bones at this age. Uh, Brent, of course, has the constitution of a hyena. And I suspect quite strongly that ooh, this may have been opened up by a hyena. So an interesting bit there, inside extremely, extremely valuable piece of food there. And that's what that bird will be going at. The lions probably cracked this open. I don't think the hyenas have been here. If they had, they would have consumed the rest of this bone entirely. And you can see there the marrow inside the bone, bright red, extremely valuable source of nutrition for many animals out here. And I suspect that's what that batelier was having a go at. I've no doubt it will come back. That's a piece, I think, of the femur, the large back leg bone. And here, just give you a little idea of how small the zebra was. This is the pelvis. So it was a tiny little zebra. That's where the uh, vertebra attach. That's where the hip joints attach in there. And down to, uh, well, the femur that, like that one there. In fact, that, that's prob that may well be the hip joint that joined in there as well. So still a bit of food left. That will be picked clean by the ants. There will be some bird activity like those, vul um, not vultures, there's not enough here for vultures, but certainly like the batelier and like the tawny eagle, they will come here and have a look as well. Now, the one other interesting thing I just want to show you is here. Here are the stomach contents of the zebra. Now, they're totally gone. Basically, they've been consumed Normally they'll be consumed by uh, dung beetles. They'll actually come and take these. There hasn't been enough rain for there to be dung beetles, so I'm not sure uh, what would have flattened this out like this, maybe even termites. But what the lioness did, and I don't know if you you might want to go back and have a look if you keep archives of these, of these drives. She pulled the stomach out and she then fed it through her teeth, amazingly skillfully squeezing out the stomach contents and then she ate the intestines. Also very rich in nutrition. And the last bit I want to show you, totally indigestible, is the tail. Here's the tail of that hapless zebra and that's all that's left. The rest has been consumed and so while for many of us it was quite a traumatic experience to watch the life snuffed out of that little baby zebra, everything has been used and continues to be used. Or there are ants covered in this, um, covering this thing. It, they'll eat all the bits and pieces of the, of the stomach contents. They'll eventually take away the hair as well. And so nothing will remain. So although a nasty sacrifice for the zebra to have had to make, um, well, well worth it for so many other creatures. Just thought we should pop back here to the scene of the crime and see what it was. We haven't come up with any leopard tracks, I'm afraid, so I'm not particularly hopeful about that, but we will head back in that general direction. And I would also quite like to go to the hyena den today. I haven't been for my fix for the last two days, so I think that's what we'll do unless Scott is on his way there. Now, that bird you can hear is the red-crested Kohan. 
And we're round about the time of the year when they should be doing their suicide display. They go flying up into the air, fold their wings and crash to the ground. Just landing, just opening their wings up in time to land. And apparently that is how they tell their territories to the other red crested Kohans. Now, everybody who is a younger viewer and who is an older viewer, I suppose, if you are in the wild and you come across a carcass like that, please be careful about what you touch and what you don't, and also wash your hands afterwards immediately. If you don't have rubber gloves, well, you can pick it up like I picked it up, I suppose, but then wash your hands. Scott has got a very beautiful bird to show you, a Catholic bishop, if you like, I think. Listen carefully. Now, we started zoomed out, so you've got an idea of how far away we are from this bearded woodpecker, and it's busy doing a territorial drumming. Listen to this. as day and quickly oh sorry everyone i spoke too loudly i got too excited there nikki had increased the volume so that you could definitely pick up the audio of that <laughs> bearded woodpecker and i got so excited that i started screaming my bad um now this is another monogamous this is another monogamous bird speaking of monogamous birds earlier and we've just got an interesting report through saying that porcupine are also monogamous. So, Alistair, thank you very, very much for that. Who would have thought that Africa's largest rodent is monogamous? Rodents, you know, usually are quite fussed breeding creatures um, and probably not too fussy with who they get it on with. But porcupine are different. The other birds, the other birds that were in shot, I'm not too sure what they were. They were upstaged by the woodpecker. Um, let me have a look through my binoculars and see if I... Can't work out what's what. I think it could be a bunting. I think it could be a bunting or a sparrow. But it's very, very far for me to see with my binoculars. Well done there, Dave. Let me just show you what the, this bearded woodpecker looks like in the book. So that loud drumming, even though other woodpeckers will obviously make a tapping sound similar to that when looking for food. Duck, duck, duck. It's not as distinctive as that. Um, the bearded woodpecker is the individual here. Easy to remember for our Dutch guests, uh, Bart is a beard in Dutch or Afrikaans, and they have a barred chest, whereas all of the other woodpeckers in our area have striped or flecked or dotted chests. So the bearded is one of the easiest to distinguish. Oh, it's making some beautiful percussion on that dead leadwood tree. You can still hear it. Now, Alistair, I'm just going to get a picture of a porcupine out in my book quickly. I know we're chopping and changing here from birds to rodents. Um, and I just want to see if it doesn't say anything about the porcupine being monogamous. I'm fairly sure I have heard this before. <laughs> now, it doesn't say anything about them being monogamous in this book. But there's nothing to say that they aren't. It doesn't give the biggest rights up here. They are the most fascinating animals. I mean, look at them. They've actually got ears that are exactly the same shape as our ears, human ears. Hard to see from these pictures, but very interesting. They are a delicacy as well, I'm told. Very tasty porcupine. And being a rodent, they do cause huge trouble in farm areas of South Africa. 
and I think the farm workers are quite happy about their abundance because they get to snack on them. T told it tastes like pork. Um, yeah, so sadly it doesn't confirm that in this book, but certainly possible. Very good. It is a wonderful, still, calm, cool evening here in the Sabi Sands. And really loving being out with all you guys. And thanks so much for your contributions and comments and questions so far. virtual tourist in Dallas and you would like to know whether there are not a lot of rocks in this area, area merely because they've been graded away from the roads or if it's just a geological fact and it's just one of the geological kind of realities of this area. It's not very rocky but you do get portions of the Sabi Sands with large granite which would have been from volcanic uh, intrusions essentially many, many thousands of years ago. Um, just not on our little little uh, patch of 2,000 hectares of the 60,000 hectares that makes up the Sabi Sands. Not too far away from us, east of us here on Torchwood, there are I've um, been there once when we were invited across. So, yes, there are very degrees of rockiness in the Sabi Sands. No, it's not because they've been removed, but more because of the geology of the... I've got some more updates. I got a hold of Mike, uh, who is another guy that was driving on. It's actually the camp manager of Juma's husband. And they were out on a family drive with their little kids, and they went and stopped in at the... So you're not missing out. We are going to send you over to James. I'm not sure if you can hear me. It is a bit crackly over here, so goodbye. Hello everyone, we are now driving past where we saw Tandi and Tindana mating the other day. This is simply a function of the fact that as a guide or somebody who's found leopard before, every time you've seen leopard in one place, you're convinced that you will see them in the same place every time. So I know I'm not going to see a leopard, but I'm unable to stop myself driving along this road just to see if there isn't another leopard along here in the same place. It is called Ingwe Alley. It's not impossible. Let's hope. From here, I'm going to head up north towards the Hyena Den and see what's going on there. Now, I would be very interested why we're doing that and not seeing a great deal of animals. To find out from you how, A, you spell the word hyena, and B, how you say it. Because many people say it as if there are two H's in it. Hyena. And one of our most uh, favorite daughters, the inimitable Tara Dales, who has unfortunately left us, uh, not mortally, I just mean the company, uh, she used to say Hyena. And of course, I'd ask her how many H's there are in the word, and she'd slap me upside the head, which was fair enough, I suppose. And I'd be fascinated to know how you say it. You're a new 
viewer, which I think is just wonderful, and you've asked a very interesting question. I'm not sure you're going to like the answer. Uh, you've asked how does one actually get onto these one onto these live drives? So not watch them. How do you actually get onto the back of one of the cars here? Well, there are two ways of doing it, uh, and two only really. Now, the one is to become a presenter and do what I'm doing, and the other is to become a cameraman and do what Brian's doing. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for you to get on the back of the vehicle here. We do, um, for new staff, we bring them on sometimes so that they can see how we operate on the back of the car, but there's actually very little space. Brian needs all of the space he can for all of his uh, six foot four. His, his limbs are each of them about the same size as I am, and he's got to swivel around to move the camera, and it's the same with all the cameramen. So we don't generally take guests out on the back of the vehicles at all, I'm afraid. But Ari, you can develop some camera skills or come and do what I do and then you can do it all the time if you like. But keep watching if that isn't a solution for you. No leopard on Ingwe Alley. Ah, very pleasingly, Scott has found some large animals. Well, we have come across a herd of elephants, and this young boy seems to have quite an attitude on him. Look at him, the way he's holding his tail horizontally like that is an indication that he is not impressed with our behavior. You can hear some parrots screeching in the background, brown-headed parrots. And again, it's just such a tranquil, peaceful evening here. There's a few more members of the herd. I'm trying to work out where the rest of them are. There's some over there that you've seen, a couple on the side of the road here. And it's always important just to give elephants a little bit of time and space when you first come across them, just to get an idea of their mood and how relaxed they are with us. Nikki is obviously paying attention in the final control room, which is a relief, and she's noticed that that young Ellie bull with attitude did not have much hair on his tail. And Dave is zooming you across there to confirm Nikki's views. And you're right, hardly any hairs. Let's pan across now, Dave, to a slightly younger elephant on our left here to show you how much hair they should ordinarily have. Come on, wag your tail. There we go. So considerably larger amounts of hair than the slightly larger boy. I think this could be a girl, judging by her very angular forehead, but difficult at a young age to tell who's who. Big mom at the back, yep, it is a girl. So I'm gonna creep forward a bit. I think I've seen a young calf on the right of the road. So let's see if we can't get you some views of that. a little glimpse of it there. Disappearing off into some quite thick bush. I'm hoping it's gonna turn around. They really do love their mother's elephants and the mothers do love their babies. That's what makes them so highly protective of them. But that means that the baby's probably gonna come back into a good view. They don't stray too far from their mothers, especially when they're this young. This one looks like it's under a year of age, possibly considerably younger than that, but I can't tell just yet. Come on. There's lots of people that would like to see a better view of you. Well, the herd does seem relaxed with us, so let's see if we can't creep forward a bit, although, no, no need at just yet. Oh, look at that. A tiny, tiny little calf, still a little bit wobbly on its legs. It seems to always enjoy holding one up in the air for considerably longer than it needs to before plonking it down. <laughs> And like I said, as soon as mom moves off, it's gonna follow very, very closely behind. Let's 
just going to creep forward a little bit. Oh, no, you didn't like that. Sorry about that, youngster. We did not want to give you a fright. So rather, we will just wait for them to decide what the next moves will be. And sometimes on Safari, it's just nice to stop and listen and watch. So that is what we're going to continue to do now on this very still and tranquil evening. Watch closely as she's going to use her tusk to help snap off this buffalo thorn. There we go. Tink. Perfect. And not easy to see on this individual's tusks, but... Often with elephants, you'll see that they use one tusk more than the other, and that leaves a distinctive groove in their dominant tusk from where they've snapped off branches, just as we've seen here. Now, I think what she's going to do here, and you might need to zoom out a bit, David, she may lift up this whole dead, fallen down branch that she's kind of rummaging in, in order to access this plant that she's found within there. And elephants will often do that. They will move dead, fallen down trees that are acting as a protective covering and shelter for little saplings. But it doesn't seem like she's too interested in doing it yet. She may walk through and kick all of those branches at her feet out the way in order to be able to use her tusk more effectively in plucking them out. Let's see. She'll be able to smell all the goodness hidden under there. Donna, you are right. Elephants are so big, yet so, so tender when they need to be, when they want to be. They can, of course, be quite violent and powerful when they are required to be. But at the moment, in a sighting like this, you really do get an understanding for how peaceful and tranquil and calm these animals are. It looks to me like this female is heavily, heavily pregnant. Not easy to see at the moment. But hopefully we will get some angles where she faces us. Even now, I guess you can see the left-hand side of her stomach perfect, bulging out considerably. Well, her right, our left. Look at that. And wouldn't it be absolutely magical if she just decided to pop that little elephant out right now? I've never seen an elephant being born. Now they have most safari guides. It's something that many people would love to see just once in a lifetime. And the
reason why I can confirm that she is in fact heavily pregnant is not only by looking at her, but judging by the age of her young calf over there that we're looking at now. And that calf looks to me like it's about two or th three years old, and they do give birth every three to four years on average after a 22-month gestation period. Donna, you would like to know how old will elephants be? Oh, sorry, Jennifer, not Donna, would like, would like to know how old elephants will be when they can start walking more steadily on their feet and anywhere from about six months, I would say, anywhere from six months upwards to, to around a year of age, depending on the individual, they'll start to move very comfortably on their feet and it'll probably take them just a little bit longer to actually get to grips with their trunk. They can walk far more effectively at a far younger age than they can handle their trunks, which are a very complex tool that often get in the way for young elephants. Hello, Gracie, and very, very happy to know that you are with us. Gracie, you would like to know if I've ever seen any elephants tripping over logs or sticks with their big clumsy feet, and yes, definitely, they do sometimes trip over and fall over. They sometimes even get their two front legs over a log, but can't get their back legs over, so they're kind of stuck with their stomach on the log. Oh, look at how beautiful this big old lady is and look at how heavily pregnant she is. Whew. She is going to pop at any moment. I cannot remember when last I've actually seen an elephant this heavily pregnant. And Nikki just seems to think she actually saw a small movement in the tummy, like a kick from a baby. So look closely. I didn't notice that, but it certainly is possible. I think I can see some movement, but I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's just her body moving, but no, her body was hardly moving there. So maybe we've just seen an elephant calf kicking around in its mother's stomach. Can you actually believe it? Now the young calf is, we don't want to start the vehicle yet because this youngster wasn't entirely happy with us as we creeped up earlier. How fascinating is that? So even though we may not see the birth, just the fact that we've seen a female this heavily pregnant is a blessing in itself. Now, because big mama over there is heavily pregnant, I don't want to put any unnecessary pressure on her, and she is moving into some thick bush. So I think we should leave the herd to it. Um, I was hoping I was going to be able to get you one more view, but it doesn't look like we are. We can try, though. Um, thereafter, we are going to be sending you across to James, who's found you some other cute and cuddly creatures. And here we are, everybody, with the hyena, the hyenas, the hygienes, the what, Brian? Hygienes. Exactly. All of them out today at a wonderful time here at the den, the Mvubu Road den. We've got the two Ds there, I think they're playing there, the two Januaries who are popping around here, very confident, coming out of the den. Of course they would be because they're the daughter of who we think is the matriarch. Those are definitely the two Ds there. D1 with the white on her left back foot. D2, uh, well, just similarly sized. And then the two little ones there. Isn't that wonderful? It's just so very sweet. There are two adults here. One in front of us there. I can't tell exactly who that is. It's quite skinny. It might be Corky. I can't see the top of her head though. No, I don't think that's Corky. I'm not sure who that is. That might actually be pretty. I haven't seen her for a while. And then, of course, on the, the den itself. Is that Madam? It is, I believe. I believe that is Madam, mother. That's it. Mother to the January twins. Marvelous stuff. Brilliant. I think this is just the best place to be at this time of the day. Most impressed with that elephant sighting you've had. It'd be beautiful to have yet another tiny little baby elephant born to us. I 
And I'm just, I'm fascinated by how confident these little ones are, given how long it took the bees to come this far out of the den, and especially how long it took old November to come this far out of the den. I don't know where she is actually right now. She will probably be around somewhere here. I can't believe she'd be away from the den. And I'm sure that they're out here feeling this confident simply because their mother is here. I haven't seen her here for a little while. Of course, I haven't looked all the way around me. I was fascinated by these little ones. There might be some other adults lying about the bush. This is wonderful stuff. So I believe a number of you have sent through comments about <laughs> Uh, how you think hyena should be said. I think you should say it any way you like, to be honest. It's quite niffy here, hey, Brian? Mm. It's got quite niffy here in the last little while, and I wonder if that won't mean that they're going to move on fairly soon. The Galago shortcut den never smelled like this. Look at this little thing. So sweet. That's D1 with her little white back left foot. Hello, Viv. As we watch these little things play, which is just the best fun. Viv, you want to know when they will eventually start hunting with their pack or with the clan? When will they go out and start foraging for themselves? They take a long time, you know. They only wean at about six months, which is quite late. And at the same time, um, they will then only start following the pack on hunts from about eight months. Probably only a year, though, will they be fully functioning members of the clan who will make a contribution to hunting. Now, what is interesting here, of course, is that that youngster there, who is, looks to be D2, if I'm not mistaken. Is that D2 or D1? No, it's D1. I couldn't see properly there. Anyway, is greeting the matriarch and also trying to have a bit of a suckle and apparently it's not uncommon for a young cub who has not belonged to more dominant females to try and suckle from them. That's quite interesting. Somebody's down there. Maybe it's November. She's crawling into the hole. January one. I don't know if you can hear it going. You can hear the mother going. <laughs> so just for those of you who are new viewers, that spotted cub there is not the offspring of the adult. You can see only the black cub is. of course are the newest born in January they're probably pushing almost mm, six weeks now you can see the spotting starting to come on their feet on their front legs <laughs> and like all young carnivores the teeth and jaws incredibly important parts of life so they will chew just about anything so sweet. I've just spotted some lightning off to the far western horizon, but no doubt it will not bring us any rain at all, but the adult here, who I can't quite identify, I don't know if that's pretty, oh you know what, look it is, it's pretty and that's November lying with her, you didn't even see her lying there, so that's mum and daughter, we haven't seen them together for some time, why well, haven't? That's very sweet. But she suddenly sat up and looked off to the west, and that was because there was lightning there. Mm. Walt, as you say, and of course your name, Walt, is, um, well, it's synonymous, of course, with Disney, which produced the Lion King, and as you say, Lion King gave hyenas an awful stigma. It certainly, certainly did. 
Uh, it, I mean, amongst other fairly tragic biological misconceptions, uh, the Lion King did create villains out of hyenas, and apparently to the extent that there was a certain amount of guilt felt by Disney because of this. And if I'm not mistaken, they make a fairly enormous contribution now to hyena research and conservation around the world. Such was their feeling of uh, guilt. Some interesting stuff there. I think it's just play behavior. I'm not sure that it's that angry, but there will definitely be a dominance hierarchy and the play behavior will extend into a kind of dominance display. It's exactly the same as human beings. If you watch little boys playing with each other on the playground at the school, while you think they're all just having a good time, they're actually spending quite a lot of time trying to get one up on each other. And that will, it's amazing to watch. Actually, it's quite similar to what goes on here. If you watch a, a school where boys go to school from age sort of six all the way up to 18, the hierarchy that is set the hierarchy that's set on the school field when they're six years old, you'll find, will probably maintain not too much change until they're 18 or so and they leave school, and it'll go on even longer than that. And so it is with these young mammals. Once they've learned their place in the hierarchy, very little will be done to change that. Except, of course, in the case of males which leave the clan and then their position in the hierarchy will plummet. They will become completely low down. They will become the lowest possible members of the hierarchy in their new clan. So very glad that you all seem to be enjoying this. Donna and Geza, you especially, thank you for your comments. And, uh, well, he's got nothing to do with me, of course. It's got everything to do with these magnificent creatures that I think are a tremendously central part of what we do here. I'm just laughing slightly because Brian, of course, is a homemade viewfinder, and it is quite amusing to watch him operate on it. Now, Valerie, a very nice question about domestication, and you want to know if hyenas have ever been domesticated. Valerie, as far as I know, not completely. There are two groups of people famous throughout Africa. The adults are just having a, a chat there. It's Pretty, who is subordinate to the matriarch madam lying on the ground, and so she will do the kind of traditional genital licking with her tail up and that's just a very kind of submissive greeting that she's giving there. Although Pretty and Madam do seem to be fairly closely connected in some way. As I often say, I'm so glad human beings don't have to greet like that. Anyway, Valerie, um, there are two groups, one in Ethiopia, one in Nigeria, where the hyenas have kind of kept as domestic animals. Well, in Ethiopia, they're not. They're fed, actually, at a rubbish dump. They're fed by people, and so they come back, and they don't seem to create any harm for the people there. And in Nigeria, um, there is a family, I think, who keeps them and uses them for kind of, well, not quite circus tricks, but certainly uses them to derive an income. They haven't been domesticated further than that, as far as I'm aware. Although I think if you raise a cub from little, they're much more amenable to being friendly to people than are many of the other carnivores out here. Ah, a pretty nightmare. You've noticed that the hyena here is named after you. I'm not sure that was quite the intention, but pretty nightmare, yes. Let's call her named after you, if you are happy with that. As long as you don't find that insulting at all, oh, that's great. I'm going to sneak forward a bit and just try and get a slightly better view of them here. There's a lion. The lions are here. The lions are here. Let's just try and we're going to have try and keep an eye on exactly what's going on. The lioness is stalking. The 
hyena, I think, has smelt something, but is not sure. Has not yet. Okay, the youngster has seen this. The youngster's seen the lion. They're all gonna go inside now. Here comes the lioness. And look, the adults have come out. The youngsters have all disappeared inside. Now let's watch. Look at this. Oh, look at this. You see that she cannot get in there. As far as I'm aware, there is absolutely no way the lioness will be able to get to those little cubs. They would have gone all the way in there, onto their shelves, and she won't be able to get at them. It's such a brilliant defensive strategy. Look at this, this is unbelievable. Hear the hyenas, you won't be able to hear them. The owls are growling from behind. You hear that growling? Isn't this unbelievable? She's watching after where the adults have gone. She'll come back and check. She'll try and stick her head in there. If she can get hold of the cubs, she will kill them. But I really think it should be. If she really dug and dug and dug, she might be able to get at them, but she's not gonna make that kind of effort, I don't think. And I wonder, just an interesting one, she's come through here, like I said, and Scott said this morning, this den is starting to smell, and I wonder if that hasn't attracted these high, the lions here. I don't know if it would make them move the den. I'm not convinced that it would, to be honest. Let's see tomorrow. Maybe they will move during the night. And Steph, you're on YouTube, and you say this is the last time that they will sleep in this den. I'm not sure about that. where the little ones are, this lioness knows they're down there. Now she's calling. Ooh, ooh. Now where are the other lionesses, Deborah, Armtrey, Traveller, you want to know? I don't know. I don't think they can be too far. Brian, I'm going to sneak in to where we normally park. There goes the lioness slinking through the bush. I'm keeping an eye out the other side to see if the others are coming. I don't see them. I can still hear the adults calling, not calling, but growling from far off. Here comes the other lion. Here we go, Brian. You see it, it would be behind the tree here, I think. <laughs> she's, she's behind that tree. She doesn't seem to be coming up towards this area now. And the third one is on its way. They're all coming down here. I'll just roll back if they don't look like they're going to come in this particular direction. They're calling. They're now calling this other one. And Nikki said she thought that one that Brian's looking at was amber eyes. The yeah, others are calling. Oh. Oh, let me roll back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
this chica doesn't know who I forgot. No, 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 here they come. They're coming straight through the middle here. You see them at all, Brian? If you don't go forward. You might be able to sneak slightly forward. This tree is in a particularly awkward spot. who's not the oldest, that's the oldest you can see there, as Nikki's just pointed out to me, as was the one to lead them in here. And now that's a call to each other. Ooh. Look at this. I know something's up here. one and she's going around the front imagine seeing that if you were a little hyena imagine popping your head out the den and seeing that outside 120 kilograms 260 pounds three and a half feet to four feet at the shoulder an enormous predator Those baby hyenas will not make a sound. They won't make a peep and they won't come out. They'll be hidden deep in those burrows. They would have made themselves secure shelving on which to sit. She's now two meters from us. <laughs> that is the most wonderful thing. And they're all lying down there now, Brian. Look. I don't think they'll stay there for long. This lioness knows there's something in here. And of course, just while we're watching here, for those of you who don't know, lions and hyenas have a very poor relationship. They are in direct competition for the top of the predator hierarchy. And lions will kill hyenas if they can get hold of them. That's why those hyenas disappeared at such a speed. staring straight at the den. In front. That lioness we didn't even hear coming up behind us at all. She had a slight limp. Look, one's marking the territory now by you see that? She's showing the hyenas who's boss. I wonder if they won't move as a result of this. Cat and Tampa, you want to know if this is the first time we've seen lions at this hyena den. First time I've seen them at this one. They've come past here, though, before, because their tracks have come past here. And I've certainly seen another pride, the Shimungwe pride, at the Gallego shortcut da uh, den. incredible stuff. Now, adult hyenas, you would think Laura could take on one lioness. No, an adult female hyena. Two of them are about the same mass as one adult lioness. There's no point in them taking the risk to take them on. There's absolutely no point. Those cubs are safe inside the den. Why risk the fight unless there's food or something like that in the offing? There's no point in those adults hanging around here to have a fight, especially as they probably know instinctually that where there is one lioness, there is more than likely another. They are comp 
completely, completely silent. Now, Scott is on Mbubu Road. I'm just going to get him to head towards, towards, um, just hold on a second. I'm just going to hold up Scott. Scott, you copy? Scott, animals are now mobile, sort of towards you, but back towards Mbubu Road. They've kind of bypassed the den on the northeastern side. Okay, copy that. Okay, perfect, thanks. Stations of pride has come past the den on Mbubu Road. They are now mobile in a northeasterly direction. So Scott can see the pride there. And I was talking there into the radio, which is the game drive radio, and that just tells the other game drives, because it's not only Scott and I out here today. Brentia Smith, of course, was out. Um, well, he was stuck for most of the afternoon, but he was out as well. I'm just going to reverse slightly. This hyena's not going to come out of here now. What a sighting. Monique in London, you are very asked a very, very valid question of when those cubs are going to know that it's safe to come up, when the adults come back and call them. Otherwise, they can stay right where they are. So they've just kind of melted up into the bush there, totally silently. That one snuck up right behind us, we didn't see her. Interesting. So, Tony, you're in London, and you've been to South Luangwa, and you say you've seen lionesses trying to dig hyenas out of a den, um, and the, the adults came and chased them away. Tony, that doesn't, uh, doesn't surprise me, but I'd be very interested to know if they actually succeeded in getting hold of any. I bet they didn't. And I think that if the adults felt, and there were enough adults, I think if they felt like there was a genuine threat to those youngsters, then I have no doubt they would come. Now, Sarah, you want to know if the lions will come back to the den knowing that there are hyenas here? No, Sarah, I don't think they'd do that. I think it'd be a complete waste so of their time. There's a one running up towards them, but I think they're maybe after those pigs. And Scott's just said he's seen them, two of them running up towards Mbubu Road. There were some warthogs that we disturbed on the way in here. They will return to where they know something to eat is like a warthog. The hyenas, no, I don't think they'll return here to check. It's a waste of their time. They've spotted something there on the hunt. Scott is going around the other side. We'll follow them through here. She was two, two kills in two days would be quite something. Lynn, you want to know if I can see the adult hyena? No, I cannot, Lynn. I suspect they're in this thick stuff here. Yeah. Okay, Scott's got them there. Scott's got them. Let's go there. They're going to get one. There's some youngsters. Welcome back, everyone. Amber Eyes has got some piglets that she's kind of separated from their, their mother, and she's chasing after them. She's just come past our vehicle. It's not looking promising for these piglets. There's dust everywhere from where the lions have been running. Now well, there's a termite mound here that could be these pigs' home. Where has Amber Eyes gone? The dust is everywhere. I think she may have crossed back over. It's moving so quickly. And we're gonna send you back to James, who is with the rest of them now. If we get any sign of further action, we'll call you back. Isn't this exciting? So this is incredible, everybody. These two know that Amber Eyes up front there has been chasing something and they're moving through the bush here. They won't know what it is. They won't know it's a tiny little thing like a pig. But they don't, they certainly don't seem to be kind of on the chase yet. They don't know what she's doing just yet. I'm just gonna get around here. Get a decent look at them coming through the area. Here they come, the rest of the four. There they 
all that. This is amazing stuff. One's backing off away the other direction now. I'm just going to tell Scott what they're doing. Scott, there's one sort of heading back towards Mbubu Road now. I don't know if you've still got visual there. I can't see any at this stage. The last I saw Amber Eyes is running back towards you. Okay, copy. I've got three or four of them here. Okay, copy. Yeah, Scott, if you stand by there. So Scott is just in front of us. And he's going to stand by on the road there. And we'll just keep him posted. One of them is now moving back towards the den. Yeah, Scott, they're now coming towards the road. There's a path right here in front of us. I'm just going to be quiet and let's listen. What you notice is that the bush is carrying on regardless because these silent predators are moving undetected. There we go. There's one coming right past the front of us there, Brian. Scott, they're going back towards the den. Actually, not the den, the, uh, the burrow. She's going straight towards the warthog burrow there. Okay, copy. Thanks. Scott is going to go round the other side of that termite mound. So where there's a burrow, a warthog burrow. This car. Not too <laughs> She's right on the mound there. She's right on the mound where the pigs came out earlier. I'm going to stop here. Scott's probably got quite a good view where he is. Hmm? Let's go across to Scott. So this is in all likelihood, the warthog's home. And you can see this lioness is using an incredible sense of smell to obviously work that one out. What a fascinating drive. Lions poking their heads into hyena dens, now warthog dens. It is all happening. Luckily, it appears like the warthog have managed to escape. And it sounds like we're going to send you back to James's view, but no, hang on. It looks like this is going to be a better spot. There's another lioness approaching, and I think we're going to get some great views. There may be a little bit of jumping and play here. I think the lioness on the top of the termite mound may take this opportunity to pounce on the one that's approaching. Now, it's not uncommon for lions to excavate warthogs out of burrows, but it's time consuming and it doesn't always work out for the lion, they can get injured by the warthogs that have got very sharp tusks. We're going to send you back to James. So we've got two of them here. Scott is not more than 50 meters, 40 meters in front of me, 150 feet or so. And the two lionesses are now on the top of the turret mound. If they head back towards Scott, we'll link straight towards him. I can't see what the one behind there is looking in. Isn't this amazing? Incredible sighting we're having here. I don't know where the other three have gone. Those pigs are wily. I think, like Scott says, they can smell that the warthog have been in here. Right, back to Scott. Which is better now. Look at that. 
is fascinating. Now, I'm not sure if there's even any warthogs in there, but maybe she can smell the smell of warthog from earlier, maybe the day before. I think those warthogs were on their way back to this den before the lions interrupted. And like I said, from time to time, lions will actually completely excavate warthogs from their burrows. But I don't think that is going to be the case this evening. Only time will tell, though. Oh, it looks like she started. That was the first paw of earth that she decided to move there now. Now, oh, they'll be able to tell if they are in there. Their sense of smell and hearing is just so much better than ours that maybe they will actually know for a fact whether they are in there. I wonder where the other ladies are. There's only two that I can see in this area. The rest are unaccounted for at this stage. And I'm sure these two are probably going to very soon lose interest on the piglets and continue off in search of the rest of the prey. Or, oh, sorry, the pride. Iguana Ray. You would like to know where this is happening. It's happening in South Africa, in the northeastern corner of our country, very close to the border of Mozambique and Zimbabwe. And this is a live safari. It's happening this very second. Hard to believe, but it's great to have you with us. Sadly, you've joined right at the end of the safari. And there's only a few more minutes left until we head back to camp. But we do do two drives daily, one starting at 5.30 Central Africa time for the Sunrise Safari until 8.30. Here comes another lioness here. So the rest of the pride is slowly approaching. And our Sunset Safari starts at 1600 hours Central Africa time and continues until now 7 o'clock. I'm hoping we may get some playful action here as the other lioness approaches, but no guarantees that that will be the case. She may, too, decide to poke her head down into the burrow. Here she comes. The curiosity of a cat, I guess. Can't resist. She's being quite skeptical, as she should. Because warthogs, when they do have their sharp end facing forward, and they always do, they reverse into their burrows so that their tusks are the first things that come out. They can be quite bold when confronting any predators trying to poke their noses in there. Are you coming to say hello to us? What can you hear out there? She just stopped and look at that. Look at her body language. Absolutely honed on something off ahead of her there. I'm sure she's now smelling where the warthogs have been moving. And wouldn't it be fascinating to have a sense of smell as strong as a lion's? Okay, well, we're going to say goodbye and leave you guys with James and these lions. It's been great fun spending the evening with you. And thank you very much for all your questions and contributions. Well done, Dave on camera. Well done, Nikki and everyone else in the final control room. We will see you on the Sunrise Safari. Over to James. What a very special time this has been. Ooh, they're on the move. I think Scott might have to hang around a little bit longer. Let's see what happens. She's gone down back towards the road. Just get Nikki to tell Scott that. He's going to go around. He's got a better chance of seeing them. 
the moment. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, fantastic sighting, hey? Oh, she's right here. The line is right here. I'm going to wait here. Scott can go around on the road just in case. something there from it sounded like inside the hole but maybe it wasn't Brian and I saw a sow two actually it looked like two sows and two piglets come flying out of this hole as we drove in here look at her listening 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 all the time those ears are incredibly sensitive, though they look like they're blocked with hair. Oh. There you can just see the movement of the tail in front, underneath. Underneath that beautiful arching piece of wood. Tina, the adults do go into the burrow with the piglets, but they feel very threatened in there. They don't have the same level of protection that the hyenas do. And so they won't be, uh, they'll come rushing out if they feel there's a threat. I don't think they're in there anymore. As Scott was saying, isn't that beautiful? That's such a cool shot. And see the others moving just through there in the light of Scott's car. And on that note, let's head across to him. So, it appears like we have got stuck in a traffic jam on the way back to camp. And so far, three of the Inkahuma ladies that you can see lying in the road, a fourth is about to join them now. Fifth one has just departed from the Termitten Mound that she was sitting on top of, and she too will be joining shortly. After a little bit of excitement, popping into the hyena den, trying to catch some warthog for starters. It appears like now they're going to have a small breather. Cat and Tampa, you are interested to know why the line were not as bold when moving into the hyena den as they were when moving into the warthog den. And I guess it's because they're probably less inclined to go hugely out of their way to catch and kill a hyena, but they would be more inclined to try and catch or kill a warthog. Um, who knows, maybe they also have a little bit more respect for what may be inside the home of a hyena. Look at how awesome this view is as they disappear off into the darkness. James Hendry has pulled up alongside us, along with Mr. Joubert. And what a great way to finish off the evening. Happy that we've been spoiled with some great action and activity with these ladies over the last couple of drives. And I think it's just about time to say goodbye. So that we shall do. Here's James. Hello. And Brian. Brian's hiding in the shadows there, so I don't think we're going to see too much of him. Nowhere else to go, really. Oh, there we go. He's popped <laughs> into the limelight. Hello, <laughs> Bebop. And what an evening, James. Pleasant surprise at the stunning, hyena den. Stunning surprise. Of lions coming to visit the hyenas. Do the pigs run? 
They were running, the, I just saw two of them that had run obviously across the road here. I saw one line is tearing after them when I first told you, and then by the time we got you, it chased them back towards the other lioness, and that's when I thought... Yeah, death that, was nigh. Yeah, mm. but the little piglets ch chose the correct escape route, obviously, because so cool. they were nowhere to be seen, so... And the little hyenas just disappeared back into the den. Chup still. Uh, that's an Afrikaans expression, everyone. And the lioness stuck her nose in. They didn't make a sound. She didn't even try and dig. And she just gave up and walked away. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. It's the first hyena lion interaction I think we've captured on film, or am I forgetting? We saw one at the Gallagher shortcut then when the Shimunga. Oh, was yes. And okay. The two hyenas actually nipped at them, but they were much younger than this lot. Yeah. Which is less formidable, obviously, than these. Cool. Incredible. Well. Right. Good stuff. We can give you one last view of the lioness disappearing off into the shadows. Thank you very, very much, everyone. And what a great scene to say goodbye with. Toodle-doo. Good night, everyone.